in Miami proper. And at Marlins Park, it's a battle this weekend for first place in the National League East. The Atlanta Braves a win last night and a one-game lead over the very surprising Miami Marlins. Jason Hayward getting ready to lead it off. He has started to swing it. Giancarlo Stanton has been swinging it from day one. Hi, everybody. Rich Waltz along with C.J. Nikowski. Who would have thought that two months in that a Marlins-Braves matchup would be for first place in the East? Well, I'll tell you, Rich, we are seeing parity all around Major League Baseball, and that is definitely happening here in the National League East, and that is why we have teams like the Miami Marlins able to compete, and they're doing it with good pitching. And when you look at this division, we see a couple of teams, even the New York Mets are believing that maybe they have a chance. They probably don't, but they think they got a chance, and that's a good thing for baseball. The Marlins had a chance to win the ball game last night and take over sole possession of first place. And it started with a Giancarlo Stanton home run, and it wasn't just any home run. It wasn't just any home run, and I will tell you, these are getting more and more fun to watch. I'm glad I'm not pitching ever. I had to face this guy as a lefty. That is a flat hanging slider that he just absolutely hammered in this ballpark to get it out to center field. Only men go out there, and there are not too many men in Major League Baseball that could do that. And how about Jason Hayward? Really, I think, starting to come into his own now as a leadoff hitter, getting comfortable there. Takes a fastball away, drives in the gap, an easy triple, showing off his athletic, excuse me, athleticism in a big situation. And it was Hayward's triple that brought the Braves back to a 3-2 win and a one-game lead in the East. And here's Freddie Gonzalez's lineup going into this one. Hayward in the leadoff spot. B.J. Upton showing signs of life. Freddie Freeman in the three spot. And Justin Upton is crushing it this year. Chris Johnson slotted fifth. Andrelton Simmons moves up to sixth. Tommy Lastella, his first week in the big leagues. Gerald Laird gets the start behind the plate and in the eighth spot. And it's Irvin Santana who spent his whole career in the American League hitting ninth. Jacob Turner on the mound for Miami. And it's been kind of a rough go so far for Jacob Turner, but he finally did win his first game in his last start. You look at those numbers, and the batting average sticks out. The strikeouts per inning stick out just a little bit. That tells you that he's not missing very many bats. That's certainly something that you would like to see him improve on. But remember, this kid is still only 23 years old. Not everybody comes to the big leagues and pitches like Jose Fernandez when they're really young. All right. For Jacob Turner, the keys to the game brought to you by Lincoln Motor Company. Well, we talked about starting a streak. He went 17 games without winning one. He won his last. Now started winning streak. Maybe a couple in a row here. Secondary pitches for strikes. His curveball, Mike Redmond told us before the game, he has got to have that curveball to be successful. Has to be able to throw it in his own. And like I said earlier, he still is only 23 years old. Give this kid some time. It takes a while to figure it out. A lot of inconsistencies. Maybe he can start moving in the right direction now. And he faces the Braves here. Atlanta coming in at... 29 and 25 Braves lost four in a row to Boston but snapped that skid last night and Hayward leads it off with B.J. Upton and Freddie Freeman to follow and a first pitch strike 92 miles an hour with good movement from Turner. And you love to see that good movement early and coming out and that's a contact kind of pitch and that's why you don't see the strike because if you keep that two seamer in the zone maybe an opportunity to keep that pitch count down. When the Braves were rolling in September last year Jason Hayward was in the leadoff spot and he is starting to get the knack of getting on base again. Three week stretch where Hayward has started to reach base, pop in his bat, and the Braves offense has started to take note. Well, I think a lot of people looked at Jason Hayward and said, he's not a leadoff hitter. Look how big and strong he is. But he is a very good leadoff hitter. He gets on base. He knows how to swing the bat, but he also knows how to take a walk. And so just because he's big and strong does not mean he has to be in the middle of the lineup. Hayward last night, a couple of hits. That triple came in the seventh for Freddie Gonzalez's ball club. A much needed win after blowing three leads in the four games against the Boston Red Sox. 2 2 down low, and the count runs full to Hayward. Neither of these teams have prototypical leadoff guys. Hayward for the Braves, Christian Yelich for Miami. It was, Upton on deck. it was interesting to hear Mike Redmond talk about him a little bit before the game and saying he actually sees him as a middle of the lineup kind of hitter eventually in his career, but he's hitting leadoff now more out of need than anything. I don't think you could say the same out of Hayward. If the, sure. if the Braves were to acquire, somehow get a guy like they had for a, a little bit, a Michael Bourne or someone like that, then Hayward probably would slide back into the lineup. But Freddie Gonzalez said he's, he's our best option in the leadoff spot. Turner steps off. Hayward steps out. Jacob Turner out of St. Charles, Missouri.
In the air to left, and it's Yelich in pursuit. One out. Umpires this afternoon. Quinn Walcott is behind home plate with Greg Gibson, Phil Cuzzy, and the crew chief, Jerry Davis. BJ Upton now, and for the Braves to improve offensively, they're hopeful that BJ Upton, who is trending upward right now, can continue. Last night he was one for two and hit two bullets one for a sacrifice fly and one for a line drive out. Well, I think the smart thing to do is really kind of temper your expectations. He is not going to come out and all of a sudden start hitting 320. That's not going to happen. But if you can see mid 200s, a little bit of that power that he showed in the past, I think the Braves would be very happy with that. Turner misses away. Jacob Turner got to the big leagues at a very young age. As did B.J. Upton with the race. And Upton continues to swing the bat well. Bangs a hit into center field. And Atlanta's got a base runner. And they've got some speed at first. And C.J., that's a, a trouble spot for Jacob Turner. Yeah, this is a this is really not a good recipe uh, for both pitcher and catcher. Jacob Turner is slow to the plate. And Marlins pitcher, excuse me, Marlins catchers have not done an excellent job or a very good job of throwing runners out. Just 26% is the is the major league average. They have been at 18% for Salta La Macchia. Uh, not a good number. BJ Upton, 8 out of 10 this year. And so it seems like this would be an ideal time, an ideal matchup at least, to try to steal it back. Freddie Freeman climbs in. Freeman just a tick below 300. But for some reason, right now, Freeman cannot hit Marlin pitching at all. You see the numbers, solid numbers. The on base percentage is always good with Freeman. But he's 0 for his last 28 against Miami pitching. Well, you, there's some good pitchers here. I mean, first of all, give credit where credit is due. These guys have been very good. I think it's been a nice surprise, especially this starting staff. But you gotta remember, Freddie Freeman got off to an unbelievably torrid start. He even made the comment to Chipper and it kind of leaked out that he felt like nobody could get him out. He couldn't swing and miss at all. It was almost impossible. Well, baseball has a funny way of humbling you just a little bit. And this is an anomaly. You and I have seen enough of Freddie Freeman to know he's a very consistent hitter. And he's hit Miami very well. He's hit the Marlins quite well leading into this year. BJ Upton, the runner at first. We're just underway. Miami and Atlanta. Right now, the two top teams in the East, the Braves are the one game lead. And Freeman gets a breaking ball and hits it a mile high. Echeverria, the shortstop, is all the way in shallow right. He had the best angle on it. Stan let him make the catch. Well, now this is my first time watching a game here. And when you go inside and see the roof, you obviously you've done tons of games here. That looked like it was headed for a beam for me. Is that my eyes playing tricks on me, or do you think that actually got pretty close to the ceiling? Well, much it did, much like Houston, much like Arizona or Seattle, the new retractable roof ballparks. There are girders that, that are in play, at least in terms of ground rules. But in this year three, there still has yet to be a ball that hits a girder, whether it's in foul territory or fair territory. The closest was last night. Giancarlo Stanton hit a ball to left field. Justin Upton was talking about it and said that he could not believe that it didn't hit anything. <laughs> Upton climbs in on 0 for 3 last night. You can add a, a 585 slugging percentage to that slash line for Upton. His brother is running from first, liner to right. Stanton is there and he makes a running catch. Jacob Turner gets through the first. Marlins and Braves underway.
anniversary of his Major League debut. Managing the Marlins here. And this is his lineup. Christian Yelich, Derek Dietrich, and John Carlos Stanton having a monster year. Casey McGee has been terrific protecting Stanton. He's driven in 32 runs. Garrett Jones, young center fielder Marcelo Zuna, the World Series champ and former Brave Jared Saltalamaki, Danny Echeverria eighth, Jacob Turner ninth, Irvin Santana looking for win number five. You look at those overall numbers and it's been a pretty good year for him. That ERA creeped up a little bit. He's had a couple of bad starts, uh, but other than that, it's been a good year for Big Irvin. Santana works quickly. Yelich, part of Miami's very young outfield. And he, like Hayward, not your prototypical leadoff guy, projects as a probably a number three hitter. But he's Miami's best option. That's right. You got to do it. You have to adjust whatever you have to do to get your lineup right. Sometimes it means moving guys around. The thing I asked Mike Redmond is that do you want him to change his approach? Do you want him to act like a leadoff hitter? And he said, no. I just want him to go be himself and learn the big leagues. Santana bounces one up. All right, what are the keys for Santana? They're brought to you by the Lincoln Motor Company. Well, these last couple of starts where he has struggled, there has been situations where he's had two outs and nobody on and just kind of ran out of gas, and they thought that he lost focus. And change of pace. He is throwing his change up way more than he has in the previous part of his His temper set more, which has been a big up. And we talked right in the ship. Let's turn that around. It's been three in a row that he struggled. Time to get things back on track. Yelich bangs one into left field for a base hit. And he's aboard. That's a nice job by Yelich right here. It's a fastball away. It's up a little bit, but it's on the outside part of the corner. And you love when you see young hitters that don't try to do too much, not trying to pull that ball, which usually results in a ground ball to the right side, uh, showing a mature swing right there for a young hitter. Derek Dietrich spent a lot of time at Turner Field because he was a shortstop at Georgia Tech. Dietrich. Second round draft pick of the Rays. He was involved in that mega trade with the Blue Jays. Pulls one. Freeman picks it. Simmons turns it. And the Braves get a 3 6 3 double play. And those two guys may be the best in the business at that. I tell you, that is a fun one to watch because that ball is hit hard. That very easily could have been down the line for potentially an extra base hit. Freddie Freeman so good with the glove. And we know about it, Andrew. Simmons. He is the best defensive shortstop. We saw Freddie not the greatest footwork when he caught that ball, got a little bit thrown off, but nevertheless, that's one pitch and two outs. And importantly for Santana, the bases are clear as Stanton comes to the plate. And a fastball in. And it's one and no. Giancarlo Stanton is having quite a year. National League leader in homers, Major League leader in RBIs. That one is deep, but twisting and foul. This guy is just so fun to watch. I mean, he's a physical specimen as far as how big and how strong he is. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can also hit a baseball far. He's got very good mechanics, and the ball just pops off of that bat. Just 24. Breaking ball chopped to short. Simmons. And Irvin Santana. A nice first inning. Scoreless through one in Miami.
Afternoon baseball in Miami. The Braves and the Marlins a weekend series to decide at least as these two teams get into June decide first place in the National League East the Braves winners last night three to two a one game lead over the surprising Miami Marlins Chris Johnson Andrelton Simmons and Tommy LaStella for Atlanta Jacob Turner ah. throws a strike to Chris Johnson coming off just a terrific year last year challenged for a batting title. Michael Kadair won it. Johnson hit 321. Trying to regain that form this year. He pulls it foul. 0 oh 2. It was really a breakout year last year for Johnson. And I think it's unreasonable to think he's going to repeat something, you know, at that level. You'd like him to be close and maybe not fall off too much. It's been a little bit more of a fall off than they certainly would like. Uh, but it just goes to show you, especially when you kind of come out of nowhere, how difficult it is to really repeat success at the major league level. Check swing, ball in the dirt, no swing, says Greg Gibson. And of course, Johnson wasn't the sexy name in the trade with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Justin Upton was. Everybody knew that Johnson had a reputation as a pretty good hitter. And for Freddie Gonzalez, he turned into an everyday third baseman. And the Braves liked what they saw so much last year. They extended Johnson with a nice contract. And he did go. And Turner has a strikeout. So a good start for Jacob Turner. It's a young right hander finally getting a win beating the Brewers. A team that was hot with the bats. Although that's redundant. They seemingly always are hot. <laughs> Turner beat the Brewers two to one his last time out and snapped him. 17 consecutive starts without a win. Here is Simmons. Well, that's really got to be a confidence builder for Jacob Turner not only to get that first win but to do it against a good team a division leader with a good offense and it'd be a close game. I mean there's a lot to be said for all of those factors building up your confidence not just the W but how you did it and who you did it against. Simmons is the toughest hitter in the National League to strike out. He's also one of the toughest hitters to walk though he did walk last night. This guy wants to put the ball in play that is for sure. The 1 1. Echeverria to his left. And Simmons is out. But the Atlanta Braves' offense has been a big issue. And getting on base has been a big issue. The Braves last year led the National League in homers and in strikeouts. And this year they come into this ballgame second in strikeouts. And that's one of the reasons. That Tommy LaStella is here. Something he did quite well in AAA is get on base. And at the same time, second base has been a, a black hole, so to speak, offensively for the Braves with the well documented struggles of Dan Ugla. It sure has been. And they know, and Freddie Gonzalez knows, and he told us with Tommy LaStella that they're going to give up a little bit of defense at second base, but they're willing to do that. That is how offensively starved they are. In the second base position, and this poor kid making his big league debut in Boston, and the baseball just finds him. And he had a couple of rough plays up in Boston, which is a tough place to play as it is. But to make your big league debut there and have to play defensively and make a couple of miscues, tough, tough debut for the young fella. Pulls a ground ball, Dietrich on to first in time, a one, two, three inning for Turner, a scoreless ball game in Miami.
One of the biggest additions to this Miami team has been veteran third baseman Casey McGee. After a big year in Japan last year, hitting behind Giancarlo Stanton, he has been a line drive and RBI machine. And McGee leads it off here in the second. Garrett Jones, Marcel Ozuna to follow against Irvin Santana. Santana getting a double play ball and getting through the first without a, a bump. And McGee takes inside. Now you played in Japan. I did a couple of years for the Fukuoka SoftBank Hawks. And so what McGee accomplished last year to win the Japan series to play with former brave Andrew Jones and put up the type of numbers he put up pretty significant. Hit 292 hit 28 home runs in Japan. And a liner to right Hayward is there and he makes the catch. McGee hit it on the button. That's what he's been doing all year. You had just talked about hitting line drives. And we only see the one home run this year. I don't think anybody cares because you don't want him to start thinking about trying to hit home runs, even though he hit all of those home runs last year in Japan with this ballpark. Keep that line drive swing right where it is, hit the gap, take advantage of hitting behind you, Carlos Stan. Garrett Jones, Marcelo Zuna to follow. Now Jones and the Marlins saw Santana on the first of May. And Jones homered against him. And that for Miami has been a, a big improvement statistically, just the power numbers as a team. 56 home runs. And this is for a team that last year was last in every major offensive category. It really has been amazing to watch. I'll be honest with you, when I saw that the Marlins picked up Garrett Jones, I wasn't sure if he was really going to be the answer at first base. Maybe they could do something better, but he has been in really nicely here. Lines it down the right field line. Now, this is a, an enormous ballpark, but it does have a home run porch in right field. Not as cozy as Jones' former home in Pittsburgh. Sure. But the right field, a little more reachable than left field. You know, the danger in having a ballpark like that where it's just down the line is that lefties can get a little pull happy. And smart pitchers know how to take advantage of that. So that's always the downside. Yes, it's nice if you pull one down the line and you can sneak it out. You don't necessarily have to crush it. The downside to that is if you start trying to do that a little bit too much, rolling over balls or hitting lazy fly balls to right field. And Jones has done a pretty good job. That average is respectable at 262. Jones ran into three teams that were very aggressive with an overshift against him on the West Coast. Padres, the Dodgers, and the Giants. He dropped down a bunt for a hit, sent a couple of line drives to left for a hit, and all of a sudden the shifts have started to ease up on him. 3 2. Simmons off of his glove and into center field. And had the shift been on, that would have been right at somebody. That's where shortstops have been playing Jones for the first two months of the season. Well, it would make sense, especially when you look at the pitch location. They're trying to go away. He missed a little bit over the plate. Not, not even too bad. Actually, that ball's still good enough away. It almost caught Irvin Santana on the way up. Luckily, his ball didn't catch him. It was hit hard. But he got out of the way. But I still thought Simmons was going to make this play. We've seen him do it so many times over the past few years. And you know he's frustrated because he wants to make the great play every time. I think anything off the bat you think Simmons is going to make the play. He, he is pop up to right. He might get there. I think without question he's the best defensive shortstop maybe on the planet right now. Agreed. Agreed. He's really fun to watch. Here's Ozuna. Runner goes. It's Jones who's running and he's out. Garrett Jones not known for his speed and Gerald Laird throws him out. And there are two outs here in the second. And I, and I actually played with Gerald Laird in the minor leagues and this is what he does. He's a catch and throw guy. Which means, you know, which is uh, language for saying he doesn't hit very well, <laughs> but he catches well. And, uh, you know, just six for nine, he hasn't had a big opportunity, but he does a good job of throwing out runners and controlling the running game. And Ozuna swings and misses at a breaking ball. The count is one and one. Marcelo Ozuna is just 23. It's the youngest team in baseball. And in outfield, Ozuna at 23, Stanton at 24. Yelich at 22. 
And Ozuna has provided power, nine home runs. This is another young, exciting player. Mike Rep that told us before the game, he thinks he's one of the best center fielders in baseball. And really probably doesn't get the play for him. Santana with a nasty breaking ball. Two innings and no runs. In a scoreless game in the third in Miami, the Braves and the Marlins. For the Braves, Evan Gaddis getting the afternoon off. Gaddis caught last night and was one for two. Gerald Laird getting the start. He leads it off with Irvin Santana and Jason Hayward to follow against Jacob Turner. As Atlanta is a first place team, though I think a lot of people. In Atlanta, puzzled a bit as the Braves kind of came back to the pack, still in first place. In Atlanta, last year, a terrific year, 96 wins, won the East. Their first division title since 2005 in the second postseason for Freddie Gonzalez. Certainly appeared like they were not going to be in the hunt at the end of spring training. Things were not looking good at all for the Atlanta Braves. And I was actually at that game when Chris Bedlin blew his elbow out, uh, calling it a Mets radio, and it was sad to see. And it was you saw almost the whole season kind of evaporate in front of you because you know how important he was going to be to that team. Tim Hudson was gone, and it seemed like Chris Bedlin knew right away when he did it. And this was a this was a big blow to this team, but they have recovered, and the, they, the Braves continue to do it. They find guys like an Aaron Harang. They open up the wallets to go ahead and get Urban Santana, and those guys perform extremely well in April. And here they are with a legitimate chance to win this division. Yeah, Frank Wren and his staff did a terrific job, and the Braves have always been able to develop pitching from within as well. Yeah, they're smart. I mean, they really are. Played for that organization. Uh, in 2004, and it's a completely different environment. I played for eight different major league teams, 11 different organizations altogether, and there was something different about the way the Atlanta Braves handled their pitching. There is an environment there that you just don't see anywhere else. Laird sends one into center field, and that sets up nicely with Santana coming to the plate. Well, the Braves right now have the best ERA in the National League. It's under three. Starters ERA. Quality starts, and to your point, and I think it's one that's overlooked because people look at the injuries to Medlin and to Beachy. They forget that Tim Hudson's no longer there. Hudson, of course, had that gruesome injury, that ankle injury last year. 
and uh, has gone to San Francisco and has pitched quite well for the Giants. He's been unbelievable. His walks are off the charts. I think he's walked just six guys in the entire season. The bunt caught flip. Not in time. Santana popped up the bunt. Turner an underhand flip to Jones. And Miami gets it out. We see Big Irv. He has spent most of his career, all of his career up until this point, in the American League. Not very comfortable bunting. Obviously, you don't want that ball in the air. You just got to catch it and let it hit the ground. But also, when you have a runner like Laird, you know that it has to be a really good bunt, too, at the same time. Laird sort of had a, a crash landing at first base there had to collect himself. Back to Hayward, who was 0 for 1. Laird's base hit, the second hit that Turner has given up. Both of them singles. Last year, Freddy Gonzalez, when he put Hayward in the leadoff spot, a 30 game trial, so to speak, his on base percentage was over 400. It was amazing how quickly he adapted to that role because, yes, he wasn't always an on base guy, but you worry about when you switch guys to such a dramatic spot in the lineup. Going to leadoff is completely different. I actually like Jason Hayward at the two spot as well, but everybody, again, looks at his size, looks at that potential power, and thinks middle of the lineup. That's just a traditional way, but you see baseball, we're getting away from tradition, and guys are getting smarter. And I think, too, there are fewer pure leadoff guys that can get on base with regularity in the game. Great, absolutely. Ricky Henderson's. There's not too many of them. D. Gordon has done a really nice job as far as speedsters go. Billy Hamilton has the look. He hasn't been able to quite get on base as much as the Cincinnati Reds would like. But we don't see guys like that. It's special to see a D. Gordon or a Billy Hamilton these days. Turner's fallen behind Hayward. Hayward's still wearing that that jaw protector. You see B.J. Upton on deck. Of course, Hayward hit in the jaw. Last year, fractured his jaw in late August. Says he's not sure when he's going to take that flap off the helmet. He's comfortable with it. He's on his way to first. A walk from Turner, his first walk of the ball game. Chuck Hernan is pitching coach for the Marlins. Turner, one of his many young starters, just turned 23. Upton rolled one into center field for a base hit. He swung it well last night. Craig Walker, his hitting coach, was talking about the at bats that BJ Upton had last night. He hit it on the button last night. And his last 10 games, you can see, he's starting to come out of it. Yeah, certainly the Atlanta Braves would take a couple of runs like this uh, going through 10 games and seeing that average. A little bit of gap power as well. This is what they've missed. This is what they were anticipating when they signed PJ up with that big contract. And to the bat, Echeverria dropped it. And it's a out. And the drop on the transfer rule. And so a line drive out off the bat of Upton. Well, a few weeks ago, this would have caused all kinds of chaos when Major League Baseball adjusted that rule about the transfer, who knows what would have happened. That rule was a, it was a disaster. And Major League Baseball did a very good job of rectifying it. And really, there was probably not a play at second base. Maybe they could have turned it, but I think Laird would have gotten back in time. Well, if this were, say, three weeks to a month ago, that's a potential double play ball because both runners were still on the base. Yeah, and that's why you have to change that rule because he did catch it. He just dropped it on the exchange. And you were, asking, you were asking people to change how they thought, how they've been taught baseball their entire lives and what they've watched their entire lives. And the double play stuff was just a mess. And the Josh Hamilton fly ball in left field in Seattle, he clearly caught the fly ball, had it for a couple of steps, and then lost it on the exchange. It was just silly. So credit Major League Baseball for admitting they were wrong because they're not always going to do that. Freeman drives one over the head of Jones and into the corner it goes. It might score two. Laird will score. Hayward right behind him. He will score. And Atlanta has a 2 nothing lead. And Freddie Freeman finally has a hit against Miami, and it's a big one. Well, you knew it was going to be coming sooner or later. You're not going to be able to hold a hitter like Freddie Gonzalez down for that long. The Miami, excuse me, the Miami Marlins have done an outstanding job. As you see the setup here, trying to go away. It's a two-seam fastball that sits middle, down over the plate. Freddie Freeman, a very good low ball hitter. Squared this ball up very nicely.
that phantom cam look. Freeman. A two run double, and here is Justin Upton. And you can see it, Turner. You can see why Mike Redmond gets excited about the high side because the life on the pitches is there. It's just the consistency, even within the zone, because he's throwing strikes, and he has been throwing strikes this year at a 65% clip, which is just slightly above Major League average. It's not about the ability to throw strikes. It's about the ability, I think, for him to throw those quality strikes within the zone. There's a difference between throwing the ball down the middle of the plate and on the corner and being able to hit those corners consistently. It comes with time. It's not easy for everybody. And for Turner, one of the big challenges in his career and, and this season, managing innings. And this is a, a good example of that. The walk to Jason Hayward turned into a big play. It brought Freeman to the plate. Atlanta has a 2-0 lead. Staying away from the big inning is so key. I played for Larry Durker in Houston. He preached that all the time, trying to figure out, control your emotions, don't let the inning get away from you, and all of a sudden it turns into a 4-5 or five run inning because you start overthrowing when you get in trouble. Uh, you have to be able, exactly like you said, learn how to manage this. Slow roller, Echeverria in the hole, quick release, and it gets by Jones, trotting home is Freeman, and Atlanta's got a 3-0 lead. This was a really tough play for Echeverria. It's a long throw. He backhands it. And you could almost see it coming because the play really kind of developed slowly. Casey McGee couldn't get to it. He's there. Doesn't take that full step. He goes all arm. And we know he's got a strong arm and he can get it there. But he did not use his legs at all in that throw as he tried to get rid of it quickly. Just did not have enough behind it. And Jones went for the pick rather than blocking the ball. Freeman watched all of this as he was rounding third and walks home. It's going to go as a base hit. No RBI and a throwing error allowing the run to score. And Atlanta has a 3 0 lead. Justin Upton at first. And Turner goes over to chase him back. Now that's obviously a run that is not Turner's fault. He did a good job of executing a pitch and getting a ground ball. The Braves got a little bit lucky as far as where that ground ball ended up. But again, controlling your emotions now, coming back here, facing Chris Johnson. Don't lose focus and let this inning get even further away. Johnson makes a breaking ball for a strike. Chris Johnson from across the state in Naples. Runner goes. Good jump. And a stolen base. The sixth for Justin Upton. Well, we really talked about it. There are some good athletes on this Atlanta Braves team, and this is not a good matchup. Turner is slow to the plate. Salto Lomaki is not particularly strong at throwing runners out. But for Atlanta Braves, and I'd say in almost any running situation, they're going to try to exploit that weakness. CJ, how does a young pitcher develop the ability to hold runners? It's tough. It's tough to do at this level. It's really the kind of thing that you want to do with development. And you talked about how early and how young he was when he got to the big leagues. If he did not already have that skill set when he got here, it's very difficult to try to play catch up while you're trying to get big league hitters out at the same time. There's so many things going on, and that's something that really needs to be attended to when you're young and in the minor leagues. Didn't spend a whole lot of time in the minor leagues. 74 starts in the big leagues at 20 with the Tigers back in 2011. And he was in the 2009 draft class. It's crazy. 20 years old making starts in the big leagues. I know we've seen a lot more younger players these days, but it's really unbelievable to think what I was doing at 20 years old and what you were doing at 20 years old. Can you imagine trying to get major league hitters out? 2-2. Two -two. And he gets Chris Johnson out. But Atlanta has a nice inning. Three runs for the Braves and a 3-0 lead.
Sunday all season long with special ticket offers. Head to the ballpark with your friends, your family. Go to MLB.com slash Sunday. This would be a Saturday evening in Miami right now. All is quiet after the Heat have advanced to the NBA Finals. <laughs> yes. Freddie Freeman got Atlanta started with a two-run double. As the Marlins and the Braves battle over first place in the National League East. Atlanta a one-game lead after a one-run win last night. Jared Saltalamacchia, Danny Echeverria, and Jacob Turner against Urban Santana in the third. And it is only the third inning, but this is an important one. You're at the bottom of the lineup, 7-8-9. Your team just scored three runs. Some people make fun of it. I do believe in the shutdown inning. I think it's important for momentum, especially when you're talking about a couple teams at the top of the division that will be battling each other. Saltalamacchia so turns on one. And Freeman takes care of it. One out here in the third. Is that something that you pitchers charted? The shutdown in it? We never kept track of it, at least that I remember, but it was something you definitely talked about. Your pitching coach would talk about it, and if he felt like he needed to remind you before you went out, if you were a guy who had a tendency to lose focus, that's been a little bit of an issue for Urban Santana as he gets a little bit later in the game, two outs and nobody on that kind of thing. If your pitching coach knew that, he would remind you. The veteran guys, the guys that are consistently successful, it's part of the reason why they are. They don't have to be reminded. I unfortunately was a guy who needed to be reminded. And Tavuria sprays the ball out to La Stella, who makes the play. And Santana with a three run lead, being aggressive and getting two quick outs. And that brings up Jacob Turner. And this is a guy in, in Santana who has spent his whole career in the American League. Eight very nice years with the Angels, last year with the Kansas City Royals. An all star in 2008. And he was one of those late signs, a, a free agent pitcher that a few teams uh, kicked the tires on. But a coveted guy, so much so that one team, the Toronto Blue Jays, reportedly had some players offer to defer salary so the Blue Jays could sign Santana and afford. What turned out to be a $14 million price tag for one season. Well, you certainly like to hear that from players in the Toronto Blue Jays showing their commitment level because they certainly can use a true ace and they're doing very well this year. But if they could have gotten a guy like Santana, that certainly would have been a nice piece. Now, at the same time, he's been in the American League his whole career. He is prone to the home run. And so for me, I was saying it from the beginning Atlanta is such a perfect fit for him. The organization that is. Pitching minded, it's all about pitching. It's a big ballpark, and he gets to come here a couple of times. So that helps with those home runs, helps quell those numbers just a little bit, and comes into this pitching environment. And he's a fly ball pitcher. And look at this outfield defense, it's a good one across the board. This was a really good fit for Urban Santana. Two two pitch, foul back and out of play. Now, Atlanta has a long tradition. Of great pitching, and I think a guy that deserves a lot more credit and publicity is Roger McDowell, their pitching coach. Agreed, 100%. Got to talk to Roger a little bit last year, and it just seems like it's been seamless. Both him and Freddie Gonzalez taking over from a regime that had Leo Mazzoni and Bobby Cox. And a one-two-three inning. That would be a shutdown inning. <laughs> there it is, a perfect one.
with a 3 nothing lead in Miami indoors Marlins Park Rich Waltz along with CJ Nikowski. And young Jacob Turner ran into trouble in the third. Freddie Freeman with a two run double a throwing error by Danny Echevarria on an infield hit from Justin Upton provided the third run. Look, you clean up nicely though. <laughs> oh my yikes. Oh boy I don't know what that's right. I look nice and young there though. I'll take that. Thank goodness. I don't know what that picture is from. Kind of leaning a little forward though. I don't know what that's all about. Yeah, like you're, I'm getting you're, ready to attack the camera. You got your game face on. <laughs> that's all right. Andrelton Simmons. Tommy LaStella, Gerald Laird in the fourth for the Braves. Simmons with a big swing and a miss. Simmons, who had the incredible defensive year last year. Offensively, 27 doubles, 17 homers. He hit 248. That occasional power that you get from Simmons and what he he showed last year is such a huge bonus. It's almost like if you look at the center fielder from the Mets at Lagaris, a guy who plays excellent defense. You're like, oh, give me just a little bit of offense. That defense is so worth it. So anytime a guy like this goes above and beyond offensively and contributes something like the power that he did last year, as a manager, you're just tickled. I mean, it is you're at you're getting more than you could ever ask for. And the toughest guy in the National League to strike out does just that. Turner with a good two seamer and he gets Simmons. It was a good one. I tell you I'm really uh, enjoying seeing the life on Jacob Turner's pitches. There is some good life there and again you can see why uh, Mike Redmond would get excited if he can just harness it a little bit to go out and strike a guy out like Andrelton Simmons is impressive. That is not an easy task. And that's one of the things Redmond told us before the ball game as Lestella takes down low. People ask, well, why can't Turner do this, or why can't Ozuna do this, or what's what's wrong with Yelich right now? And he said, you got to remember, these guys are 23 years old, 22 years old in Yelich's case, and they're young players learning how to play at the major league level. Yeah, they're doing it against the best in the world. I mean, they are not that far removed. You talked about Turner getting to the big leagues at such a young age. The downside to that, though. Is that if you do fail early, and I experienced some failure early in my career as a young age, at a young age, it can be difficult to get over. You have to be very careful about rushing guys or getting them to the big leagues too early because you don't know how they're going to handle that failure and how it can affect them in the long term. Lestella started his college career at St. John's and then transferred to Coastal Carolina. I believe he transferred after he found out you went to St. Yeah, John's. Yeah, I mean, what in the world? I mean, I mean, I'm happy for the kid that he got to the big leagues, but there's, you know, he's, he's got to check against them for. Even the Johnnies, how could you do that to us? He was a terrific player at Coastal Carolina, and he's aboard at first. And Gerald Laird is up. You know, there always seems to be a player in the big leagues who, for whatever reason, leads a charmed life or just seems to be in the right place at the right time. And Laird has been that as a backup catcher. <laughs> He's been to the postseason the last three seasons. And <laughs> he has a world championship ring from 2011 with St. Louis. Got to the World Series in 2012 with Detroit. And then last year into the postseason with Atlanta. Sort of the Eric Hinsky of this ball club. Hinsky, of course, a brave for a while and had a, a run of going to the postseason, Boston. New York with the Yankees and Atlanta. Yeah, Hensky was on an unbelievable run there for a while, and Jared Laird has has also experienced that. That's because of what he brings to the table as a backup guy defensively for teams that win more often than not. They like their backup guy to be a catch and throw guy, and certainly Laird has done that. Uh, he can come in and catch your big your big starters if you need him to. You feel comfortable about him filling in for a week or two if somebody goes down with an injury. I told you I played with him years ago. He's a great teammate too, fun guy. Uh, really nice to see him have this kind of success because when I was playing with him, he had not reached a big league yet. You weren't sure what his career was going to be. So it was always nice to see guys get it done and have a nice career. But here, Turner has fallen behind 3 0, and we talk about managing innings. He walks Lestella, he walks Laird, the seven and eight hitters in a lineup where you want to go after the, the bottom third of the order. And Chuck Hernandez, Miami's pitching coach, is on his way out to the mound. Well, when I see that, I don't think. 
you know, in the little bit that I've seen him. I don't think it's mental. I don't think it's a mental issue of not being able to focus when you're facing a guy that's hitting 222, who's a rookie, another guy who came in hitting 217. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's an inability to repeat that arm slot consistently, repeat those mechanics consistently. That's the issue. He's just having a difficult time harnessing and stuff because it just doesn't, to me, look like it's something that's going on upstairs. And that's that's difficult to do. And again, he's still very young. And though he does have experience, he's, what, 39 starts into his career and has just over a couple hundred innings. So basically about a full season or more, a little bit more under his belt. It just takes time. And some guys never get there. Uh, but I think when you see the stuff, you you hope he can because there certainly is a ton of upside again in the movement and the life on the pitches but it's that ability to, to have command with him that's been an issue. Well, he's part of a very young rotation and a rotation that obviously took a pretty big hit Jose Fernandez going down Tommy John surgery and Mike Redman his reaction to that is that the, the other young pitchers in the rotation have to stand up including Turner whether it's a Nathan Evaldi or Henderson Alvarez or Turner or Tom Kohler. It's a good group to choose from. There's some good ones in there. And the next wave of prospects for Miami are arms as well. Doug Desenzo down at third base with the side. Santana tried to bunt back in the third and was unsuccessful. Jones creeps in at first. And this one, a better bunt. McGee gets the out. Trying to turn that into a base hit. And Irvin Santana should know better than that. That is definitely going to be an out. You do not want your starting pitcher sprinting at full speed like that, trying to stretch that into a hit. We never advocate dogging it, but that is a time where I'd rather see my starter take it easy. The Atlanta Braves have had enough injuries. We don't need Superman trying to sprint down to first base. He said yesterday, all those years in the American League, he was kind of jealous of National League pitchers because they got to hit, they got to bunt. He played a little shortstop growing up in the Dominican. <laughs> See? He's having fun and happy. He's going to go. Loves the game. He's going to go ask uh, Carlos Tosca what his time was <laughs> down to first. And he's going to tell him, slow it down next time. I'm not worried about your time. I'm worried about you giving us seven or eight innings tonight. All right, it's a big moment for uh, young Jacob Turner. He's got Hayward at the plate. The Braves with runners second and third. They could crack it open here. A 3 nothing lead now. Two outs. And it's one and one. Hayward has walked and flied to left. In the center field. That's a base hit. That's a big base hit. Three nothing becomes five nothing. And that's a nice job by Jason Hayward staying in the middle of the field. And as we'll get a chance probably to see this replay, you see Jacob Turner, how frustrated he is. He's trying to get this ball inside on Jason Hayward's hands, and he's unable to do so. As you see, the catcher Salto locking set up. It's right over the middle of the plate. It's down, and that's why it ended up being a ground ball. But he lets him get his arms extended, and Jason Hayward does a nice job, again, of not trying to do too much. If he tries to pull that ball, it's a ground ball to the right side, but he stays in the middle of the field. Jacob Turner continues to struggle just having that command inside the zone is what he needs. Hayward is knocked into Freeman is knocked into BJ Upton swings and misses but you come back and you see that pitch right there that is so filthy that 93 mile an hour sinker righties have the toughest time trying to get the barrel on that ball it's tantalizing and at the same time it's frustrating because he's right now getting beat five nothing. And equally as painful for Mike Redmond is the pitch count is up at 65, and Miami's bullpen is very thin right now, especially in the middle. Good at the end, Steve Ciszek. Getting the game to Ciszek has been an issue. Yeah, for games that they are winning, obviously they prefer that their starters go deep. For games that are losing, it's a good opportunity for some of those young, inexperienced relievers to get some major league innings without some pressure. Owen two. BJ Upton in the offseason. Look at the uh, Marlin bullpen. Ciszek on the left. Dan Jennings, Chris Hatcher, two of the young relievers. Upton with a count 0 and 2. Jason Hayward at first. And B 
B.J. Upton continues to swing it into left field. His second hit. Miami's bullpen is still. That might not last. Well, what happened here is Jacob Turner wanted to throw that same sinker that he threw the first pitch to B.J. Upton, where he buries it down and in for a ball and tries to get him to swing over it. It's an 0-2 count. But what he does again is he misses it over the plate. Too good of a strike to hit, especially in that count. And he shook off Salta Lamakia to get there. So you know he has a plan. and He has an idea of what he wants to do. He's just struggling to execute that plan consistently. Now Freeman. Two-run double his last time up. Which snapped an 0 for 29 against the Marlins. Chuck Hernandez off the phone. Miami's bullpen is scrambling. Freeman just 24. And a guy that has had just a terrific start to his career. His OPS has risen every year as a Brave. And the Braves rewarding him. Locking him up to an eight year, $135 million contract. Atlanta's been very proactive with uh, guys like Freeman or uh, Craig Kimbrell. I'll tell you, Ron, they've done a really good job locking up those young guys. And I think knowing that the stadium is coming, revenues are going to change a little bit. They're still kind of in uh, not the greatest TV deal. Uh, so they know they are somewhat restricted. Uh, but it's a smart move. Lock up the guys that you believe in, the guys that you think will be there. And you're getting them at a discount, hopefully, unless they don't develop the way you thought they were going to. But Freddie Freeman is a pretty good bet. And for me, one of the most impressive things that he does is he has power the other way. He can take a good fastball or a good off-speed pitch away, drive it to the left field wall or even over it, and he does it with some of the best in the game. 16 doubles now. He talked about the new ballpark. Cobb County 2017 42,000 seat ballpark and complex for the Braves moving north of Turner Field closer to uh, the Braves field not only the fan base another walk and the bags are loaded but also the Braves are such a terrific regional ball club they draw from so many states that goes back to the, the superstation days and their reach across the south. That ballpark and that complex may be a better fit in terms of getting fans, much like St. Louis is. Fans that come from out of town for a weekend, uh, stay in hotels nearby, eat in restaurants, and watch the Braves. Right now, they're watching the Braves. A 5 0 Atlanta lead. And Jacob Turner is struggling. To get through the fourth, Archimedes Caminero is up in Miami's pen. Okay, going back to that stadium, there was a lot of criticism towards the Atlanta Braves for leaving downtown Atlanta, but it is a smart move. And when they look at where the bulk of their sales come from, their single game ticket sales, a lot of it happens out of downtown and north. And I live in that area, and so I understand why they wanted to do that. Now, there probably will be some traffic issues. Uh, but getting down to downtown Atlanta to see a baseball game can be difficult because the, the park is actually south of downtown. So you have to go through where the bulk of your customers are coming from the north and the northeast and west. It makes sense if you can afford to do it, find a way to do it to bring that stadium a little bit closer to them. Two and one to Justin Upton. And Jacob Turner has essentially lost it here in the fourth. He's walked three. He's given up two hits. And it has been a tough start. With a 23 year old out of St. Charles, Missouri. Four walks, three strikeouts. McGee bobbles, gets the out, and the Braves tack on two and lead it in Miami, 5 0.
beaten the Nationals twice in a two game series. But the Braves with a win last night. A one game lead over Miami. The Nationals pull within two at an even 500. Christian Yelich leads it off against Irvin Santana. Derek Dietrich, John Carlos Stan Santana has faced the minimum. A double play in the first, a caught stealing in the second, a race the only two hits for Miami. And he's throwing the ball really well. Five ground outs, including that double play, just a one line out. No walk, one strikeout. Really Yelich into the gap right center. He's got good wheels. And it's a great place for triples. And Yelich isn't stopping. Simmons, a great arm, and his throw. Not in time. And he has a triple to lead off the fourth. Well, right on cue, as I was saying, how well Irvin Santana was throwing. Richard Yellows comes in and puts a nice at bat. Nice swing on this ball. Again, you see what happens more often than not. Pitchers missing their spots. Santana was trying to go away. That ball cut back over the plate and actually cut into Yellich a little bit. Great swing, great hustle. As he shows off the wheels and lead off triple here. Brett Butler is the third base coach for the Marlins and is very much aware of the arm of Andrelton Simmons. Any relay play, whether it's a play at third or a play at the plate. Butler says he has to take that into consideration when you add up the factors on whether to send a runner or not. Dietrich makes it a change up for a strike and it's 0 1. Well, the thing about third base coaches is that you really never notice them until they do something bad. And those times that they get a little over aggressive or misread an arm or a cutoff, uh, fans are all over those guys. That is not an easy job because you have to decide early. You can't decide too late. And it can be very difficult uh, to let a player know when to hold up and when to go. Breaking ball misses in and one and one to Dietrich. Now you talked about it earlier, managing innings. Now here it is a 5 0 game and a leadoff trip. For a veteran like Irvin Santana, he doesn't want that run to score, but you just have to assume it is going to score. You're not giving in, but your focus becomes the hitter at the plate. Let him ground out. The infield is back right. If he grounds out right now and that run scores, he'll take it. You have one out and nobody on. And that's what good veteran pitchers understand. It takes a while to learn that as a young guy because. A lot of times the young guy will try to strike hitters out and try to avoid giving up that one run. It's okay to give up one when you have a five run lead. Just don't let it get out of hand. Santana 1 2 coming to Dietrich. And he lines it into left field, a base hit. And the former Yellow Jacket from Georgia Tech gives Miami their first run. Yellich scores, and that brings Stanton up to a 5 1 game. A game changer profile brought to you by T-Mobile, official sponsor of Game Changers. And for Stanton, he leads the National League in homers, leads the majors in RBIs. The home run distance is just incredible. <laughs> His average homer is 431 feet. Since 2011, 18 over 440. And he's got five homers this year over 450 feet. That graphic is nightmares. That's the kind of thing that you wake up to as a pitcher in a cold sweat. It's one thing to give up home runs. It's another thing to be humiliated by a guy who can hit the ball well over 400 feet with regularity. Dietrich the runner at first. And Santana chases him back. I was really curious. I asked Mike Revin before the game. You know, he's seen it all. He's been around the game a long time. I said, this guy hits the ball as hard as anyone I could ever think of. Who does he remind you of? Any guys out there that you've seen? He goes, listen, I've seen McGuire, Sosa, Bonds, all of them in their prime. He said, Stan hits the ball harder than all of them. It's not even close. Those are, those are big names. Well, there's actually data to back that up. Major League Baseball and a lot of the advanced metrics in, I guess, technology is able to track the speed off the bat probably for the last 10, 11, 12 years. Stanton in a home run, a grand slam here against Jamie Moyer. Had the ball leave the bat at 122.8 oh. miles an hour. It's the fastest ball ever recorded off the bat. And the home run went, I believe, 465 feet. That is fascinating. And really, you couldn't drop a worse matchup for Jamie Moyer than Stanton. You think about a soft tossing, tossing lefty who maybe makes a mistake over the plate. A guy who's that strong with that kind of bat speed. And it makes sense that that was the matchup that set the record. And uh, that's an amazing number to think he did baseball that hard.
Well, Moyer was 47, I believe, at the time. So <laughs> there's that, too. That would be an advanced metric of another kind. 2-2. Two -two. It's up. First, you feel lazy for being retired at 41 years old for playing. For Stanton, one of the biggest psychological hurdles this year, especially with a guy like McKee behind him, is the realization that he doesn't have to hit a home run to drive in a run. Last year, he felt with a depleted roster, he had to hit a, a three-run homer for Miami to have a chance to win a game. Yeah, Santana with a nasty breaking ball strikes him out. So Stanton is over two. McKee comes up. Dietrich still at first. I think Big Irv caught a break earlier in the count where he left the slider over the play, but he does a nice job of executing there to finish off Stanton. I've been on teams that you were talking about guys feeling like they have to shoulder the whole load uh, on bad teams. It could be very difficult. That's a nice looking slider right there. Not too big, but just enough downward movement to get Stanton to think that it looked like a fastball, just enough to fool him. Very nice execution by Big Irv. Now McGee, who lined to right in the second. McGee went to Japan last year with the hope of breathing life into his career. Because he had, he had really stalled in 2012 with the Pirates and the Yankees. That was after having a couple of nice years in Milwaukee. Teammate of Masahiro Tanaka over there playing with the Eagles, and you talked about Andrew Jones as well. And I spent two years over there, and it makes perfect sense. A lot of times you need a break. I mean, there is a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of stress that can come along with playing Major League Baseball, and if things aren't necessarily going your way, uh, a year off and playing overseas uh, is a nice break. I remember feeling it myself, like, oh, this is nice. I can breathe. I have a guaranteed contract that I've kind of gotten away from the pressure, and you feel like you could go back. And we've seen a lot of guys do it. Casey McGee has been a, su a success story. Kobe Lewis has been a success story about guys that have gone to Japan and come back. The old stigma used to be you go over there, your career's over. You're going to go finish it out over there, and you're not coming back. Well, that certainly has changed, and there's a lot of benefits for guys. I, I always tell guys, I get calls all the time, guys want to get over there. Hey, how do I get over there? You know anybody? Usually minor league guys. It's tough. It's not that easy. I loved it. It is a great experience. It's not for everybody, uh, but I really enjoyed the two years that I spent over there. Oh, two. A key, a jam shot to right. And Hayward is there and makes the catch. And Garrett Jones comes up. And Urban Santana just keeps pounding the strike zone right now. He hasn't walked anybody. And he certainly has uh, sharpened up from his last three starts. That was one of the things that you were looking for early in the ball game is how would he respond. His last three starts have not been good. No, they have not. And so far, I've been very impressed with what I've seen. This was an inning that could have got away from him. The first two guys get on a triple and a base hit. He's got a couple of really tough hitters coming up, and Stanton McGee, he's taking care of them so far. And now it's that two-out deal with a lot of guys. And I don't necessarily think this is for Santana, but for two outs here, now he needs to focus. But you see, in the first six starts, he was lights out. And then he had a bump in the road, and it wasn't a it wasn't a pleasant one. As he had that nine ERA over those three starts and took a couple of losses. It was getting hit around just a little bit but so far in this start he's bounced back nicely and I guess this is a real contrast here you've got Santana who's in his 10th big league season he's 31 and you have Turner who's 23 and we've talked about managing innings something that Turner has failed to do Braves got three in the third two here in the fourth Miami is on the board but down 5-1 Jones Hooks a ground ball just foul. And for Turner again, the hope is high because the stuff is there. He has to figure out a way that when he could divide the plate up into thirds, outer third, middle of the plate, inner third, and be able to stay there pretty consistently. A lot of guys can do it a couple of times. A lot of guys can throw a pitch where they want to, maybe four out of ten times. That's going to lend itself to a lot of inconsistency in the big leagues. Guys like Greg Maddox are eight to nine times out of ten trying to hit spots. And so for Jacob Turner, just trying to get to maybe that six or seven mark where it feels comfortable executing a little bit more it can do it consistently and then the sky's the limit Jones on a good back foot breaking ball from Big Irv as CJ calls him Urban Santana has been splendid and Atlanta has a 5-1 lead
Braves and Marlins battling over first place in the East. And right now, it's all Atlanta. Winners last night by a run. And a 5-1 lead here. Game two of this three-game weekend set. Rich Walt, C.J. Nikowski. The fifth inning rolls around. Chris Johnson, Andrelton Simmons, and Tommy Vestella for the Braves. I think Chris Johnson was kind of hoping that Turner wasn't coming back out for this inning. He's struck out twice and has not seen the ball well against him. And he finds himself quickly in an 0-2 hole. TP, Terry Pendleton down there at first base. Been a lot of continuity on this coaching staff. We talked about the transition from Bobby Cox, Doug Desenzo across the way. Freddie Gonzalez, who was on Bobby Cox's coaching staff. Greg Walker, the hitting coach, Roger McDowell, pitching coach, Pendleton. Swing and a miss by Johnson. So he has struck out three times against Jacob Turner. It doesn't hurt that John Sherholtz has been with the Braves so long. Frank Wren as well. Done um, Simmons. Job. They've done a great job, and like I said, there is a little bit of a different feeling. People ask me all the time, you know, "What's your favorite organization to play for?" And they're up there in my top two. I love playing for the Yankees just because I grew up a Yankee fan. But uh, the way that the Braves conduct their business is uh, is really second. To them. You, know, so you never hear anybody say anything on the way out. It's one thing we say about the Braves. You, you never see a player leave, and kind of throw darts on his way out the door. And I think that's because a lot of times you are treated. So professionally, even if it doesn't go your way, you're treated so professionally that it's, it's really hard to say a bad word about the organization. Simmons on an 0 for 2. Miami would like to get another couple innings, or at least this inning, out of Turner. He's due up fourth in the bottom of the inning, so that might be impossible to get two innings. As we talked about, Miami's bullpen thin, especially bridging the gap from uh, inning five through eight. You see the pitch count sits at 82. Simmons pulls a bouncer. McGee gets the out. Let's go to Rob Stone in Los Angeles with a game break. Rob? We were talking about Tanaka. There was his uh, third baseman last year. Along with Andrew Jones, the, the brave legend. They won the uh, Japan Series the first time. The uh, Eagles had won the Japan Series. That uh, was a big deal over there. And I actually got to see Tanaka when he was a rookie. He made his very first Major League starter, you know, Japanese version of Major League start against my team. I got to see him as a 19 year old kid or 18 year old kid. He was so young, right out of high school. No minor league time for him. And it was just amazing. You know, you we used to see that here once in a while, maybe 30, 40 years ago. You'd never see that now because development is so important. And you saw a good arm. So, okay, here's a kid with a pretty good arm, but he still had a long way to go. And, Kind of kept your eye on him. You knew Darvish was going to be the next one to come, but uh, boy, he has really turned into something special. Tommy Lestella at the plate. And he barrels one up and drills it into center field. Ozuna cuts it off. Lestella with his third big league hit. What a, a scene it was at Fenway Park with Lestella, who's a New Jersey guy. His family at Fenway he makes his major league debut, gets a couple of hits, and after the ball game, he was able to present. That baseball, his first major league hit to his uh, his father, to his family. That's so awesome. I get chills, you know, hearing stuff like that. You play this game. There's so many kids that play this game and share this dream their entire lives, and and show so few are actually able to experience it. And to know that he had that moment to be able to give that to his dad, that is really. Cool. Gerald Laird drops down a bunt, and it's foul. It's still odd. In two ways. One, not to see Brian McCann with the Braves. And two, to see him in pinstripes for the team that you grew up rooting <laughs> for, the Yankees. It just it's it's an odd feeling because McCann was really kind of the last link to the the Chipper, Smoltz, Clavin, Maddox, 
Andrew Jones days because McCann remember at the end of Smoltz's career was kind of Smoltz's uh, caddy so to speak he broke into the big <laughs> leagues catching him. yeah it is and he was kind of the bridge I think from that old generation to the new one because now this new generation that is here of Braves kind of looked at him as the vet he was the guy and he came in as the young guy with that old generation and it is weird it's unfortunate that is you know the economics of the game and how things work these days that we have to see our favorite players leave and go play in other cities but it stings a little bit more I think for Braves fans when they see more of those pitch strikes. Runner goes ball in the dirt salt to Lamakia makes no effort twice now Atlanta has a stolen base without even a blink from salt to Lamakia. Yeah and again that's just the downside of, of Jacob Turner being slow to the plate guys getting great jumps as you see it here I mean yes that's a very slow delivery with the runner on base and for time of the Stella his first major league stolen base. Bouncer to short, Echeverria has it, fires across. Halfway through in Miami, and the Braves have a 5 1 lead. These are the rolling windows in left field. You can see the Miami skyline from the ballpark. It's one of the unique things about this ballpark as opposed to other retractable roof parks. And another unique thing, and I've got to get you down there to experience the Clevelander. Careful, my wife is watching. An iconic <laughs> South Beach uh, hotel nightclub. And they've got a great pool, great restaurant and bar down there. In left field. I'm going to use you as my excuse is why I went. I think that'll fly. Just tell him Joe Simpson sent you. <laughs> like this is a cool ballpark. There, television doesn't do it justice. This is my first time here, and uh, this is a, this is a really beautiful park. It's very Miami. Yes. With the uh, the Art Deco and a lot of tile and a lot of color, and a good crowd here. With a, a concert, post game concert, BOB is a concert. Oh, wow. That's the uh, Budweiser Bowtie Balcony out there in left field that Giancarlo Stan has been known to drop in during the game. <laughs> Ozuna Saltalamaki at Chivaria against Santana, who has looked sharp. And I think for the Braves, Roger McDowell and Freddie Gonzalez to see Santana pitch this well. A little reassuring after his last three starts. Oh, absolutely. Listen, you know, you have confidence in your guy because you know the stuff is there and you know he's done it before, but that doesn't mean as a coach you're not a little bit anxious, just kind of wanting him to, to get off the track of the bad outings. And he's not out of the woods yet. It's been 
you know, four good innings for him. You certainly like to see at least six, seven, maybe pitch into the eighth if he keeps that pitch count down. But it's reassuring at least what you saw, what you've seen so far. Now, at the same time, his first few innings in this last start were good. He ran into some trouble in the fifth inning. So this one becomes kind of a key for him, especially since he's at the bottom. Of the and he loses Marcelo Zuna. First pitch of this ball game wasn't thrown by Jacob Turner, it was thrown by B.O.B. The ceremonial first pitch. Well, that was better than 50 cents first pitch. That's right. Not not much, but it was it was better. At least it was catchable. That's but cool. you know that he saw the, the video of, of 50 cent. Pretty good. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't bring myself to do it though. I can't say it. Come on. I, I, it's I, not I, 50 <laughs> cents. Salta Lamakia takes inside. Salta Lamakia has been scuffling. An 0 for 14 skid with six strikeouts. And that's the reason that Mike Redmond dropped him down into the seven spot and promoted Ozuna. Ozuna's at first. Santana from the stretch. I don't know that there is any pitcher in the last 15, 20 years that has come out of the Dominican that doesn't have that great circle changeup. And it's really been a pitch that has developed more for Urban Santana. Through his career, he only threw his changeup about 6% of the time. This year, he's at 16%. That is a huge spike, and that was something that developed for him right before he signed with the Atlanta Braves. And that, that's a tradition of that pitch. Pedro Martinez, obviously, for this generation of pitchers, guys like Santana that grew up watching Pedro, Edinson Volquez, Johnny Cueto, they all throw that good circle change. But for Pedro Martinez, it was a guy like Jose Rijo or a Mario Soto, if you want to go back further. Good Dominican pitchers that really perfected that pitch. And it's not easy to do. It's very difficult to slow the baseball down without giving it away. Without slowing your body down, having that same arm speed. That is what makes a changeup so successful, a good one. Is that the entire time a pitcher is going through his motion, it looks like a fastball. His body does not change, but yet that ball is able to have anywhere from eight on the low end up to 12 miles an hour difference, and you get guys way out front. Now, his has a little bit more depth to it, too. Salta Lamacchia's struggles continue 0 for 2, and a strikeout here. And that brings up Echeverria. Well, I'm glad that you gave the sky report. On Santana, and then we didn't have Santana give the scouting report. <laughs> Yesterday, when we talked to him, I, we asked him, "All right, tell us about your pitches. Which ones do you like?" And he rattled off like eight different pitches. I got a four seamer, <laughs> a two seamer, a change. I can throw a split, little slider. Look, he very proud of the fact that he's got a, a variety of pitches that he can use. Well, the changeup really has been key, and that's it's always encouraging when, at 31 years old, a guy who has a pretty good track record. Uh, is well sought after can actually get better and that's what this game really is all about and that's another lesson uh, for young pitchers you see so many on this staff here in Miami that they can learn from older guys who you are at 23 is not necessarily who you will be at 27 31 32 you are constantly tinkering trying to get better working on things because the league is going to adjust to you Jeff Baker's on deck Turner's spot in the lineup in a 5 1 game, and Turner has already hit 90 pitches in his five innings of work. Echeverry, a young shortstop, 25 year old Cuban, and he's been part of what was an enormous trade at the time with the Blue Jays and the Marlins. It didn't work out so well for either team last year, but both teams this year. Have exceeded expectations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I had kind of written off the Blue Jays after the disaster that they were last year, but things are looking good for them right now. They are swinging the bat extremely well. And Echeverria pulls it into left field, the base hit. Azuna stops at second, and it's Baker who will take the at bat now for Miami. And we just talked about it. You know, Freddie Gonzalez is kind of hoping that Urban Santana can get through this inning. A good slider there. He just left it out over the plate. He's trying to sweep it just a little bit more. And Chabri does a nice job. I mean, it's not an easy pitch hit. He wasn't great location, but you still have to be able to hit that ball and stay back. And he barely did. He covered off the end just a little bit, but stayed back just enough to drive that ball in the left field. Miami has two really good veteran bats off the bench. And 
and uh, both are former Braves, Jeff Baker and Reed Johnson. This is Baker. Pulls the ground ball. Johnson has one. Lestella's turn on the mark, and the Braves get a 5 4 3 double play. Big pitch by Irvin Santana, 5 1 Atlanta. the new season with Chevrolet share your excitement using hashtag the new Marlins Park 5-1 Atlanta on top into the sixth in Miami and in Miami at the top of the list of elbow injuries in the big leagues Jose Fernandez the rookie of the year out for the rest of the season we've talked about the Braves Losing two out of their starting rotation, Chris Medlin and Brandon Beachy. The Athletics, you know, when the Athletics and the Rays lose someone to a, a Tommy John surgery, those are two of the most progressive organizations in baseball. It's Archimedes Caminero comes in. Doesn't it tell you, CJ, that nobody has the answer? Nobody does have the answer. And Dr. James Andrews has put a lot of time into this and there's a bunch of different factors, but there is no one answer. He's concerned about what the pitchers are doing when they're young. Uh, he's concerned about the velocities and the 91 mile an hour sliders that we see, but uh, there is no one answer, and it's just unfortunate because we're seeing our stars. It's frustrating when we lose a Jose Fernandez, who you know is must see TV every five days, and, and that's kind of the downside and the sadness to some of this. But it's part of baseball. It just seems like it's happening a lot this year, and I really don't think it's going to go away. And this is a division, the National League East, that really has been affected. You saw the, the two brave starters. You see Jose Fernandez. The Mets have Matt Harvey on the shelf after Tommy John. That'll be an interesting dynamic. Harvey wants to come back and pitch in September. The Mets want him to take it slow. The Nationals, of course, had to weather Steven Strasburg and Jordan Zimmerman. That's right. Tommy John surgery. It has been pretty unbelievable to think that what it's done to this division. But you talked about the Rays and the A's. For me, the Tampa Bay Rays, once that happened to Matt Moore, I don't want to say that they were done, but they were in huge trouble. They've had a difficult time recovering. Plus, there's been some other injuries to guys, guys like Alex Cobb. They were so dependent on their starting pitching that that was a huge blow to them. The A's did a nice job, and they found a couple of key pieces. Santana into center. Ozuna races over and makes the catch. Big Earth thought he might have smelled a hit there for a second. You know, we got a little bit excited. But as I was saying, you know, for the A's, they did a great job. Jesse Chavez has never been a consistent starter. He has two big league starts in his career, and he has been outstanding for them in that rotation. Drew Pomerantz, first-round pick who has been traded twice 
a guy with a good arm who they actually put in the bullpen and he got comfortable in that Oakland atmosphere has done a really nice job filling in. And so for the A's, they've been able to find guys to replace their Tommy John surgeries. The Rays have not had as much luck uh, with guys like Eric Bedard trying to figure it out. So it, it's tough. It's very tough on those kinds of teams. The A's have they got a little bit lucky. I think Billy B will tell you that. Stanton and Hayward flies to right. Braves on top here 5 1. Big hits in the ball game. Freddie Freeman a two run double. Jason Hayward a two run single. Jacob Turner was not sharp for Miami. He lasted just five innings. He gave up the seven hits, five runs, four of them earned. Walked four, struck out four, and that's why Archimedes Caminero is in the ball game right now. BJ Upton pops it up. Jones and McGee converge. It's Jones. Who makes the catch and a brief appearance by the Braves in the six five one Atlanta. When the series started last night, Miami and Atlanta were tied for first place in the National League East. The Braves came from behind last night, a 3 2 win. And this afternoon, as it turns tonight here in Miami, a 5 1 Atlanta lead. Ah. Major League Baseball on Fox Sports 1. Rich Waltz, along with CJ Nikowski, Christian Yelich, top of the order for Miami against a very effective Irvin Santana. Yelich has had the best at bats for Miami, a single and a triple. And he looks good. You can see why Mike Redmond likes him so much and sees him potentially again, as we talked about. A middle of the order type of hitter. He's put together some good at bats today. Impressive to watch in person. You get to see the Marlins a ton nationally and get a chance to see these guys live. Uh, it's an exciting time for this organization. I know the Jose Fernandez news was tough, but. See why there would be some optimism here, man. Well, we just last half inning referenced the, the trade that Miami made with Toronto and sending a, a lot of veterans and a lot of salary and getting a, a ton of young talent in return. And it has taken a year for some of that talent to take root and restock the minor leagues. Diving stop. Yelich has good speed and he beats it for a hit. He's three for three. Great job by Listella there, even getting to that ball. He is not known for his glove. The reason that he is on this team, why he's gotten this opportunity, is because he's an on-base guy. A little bit of a 
you know, not completely, but somewhat of a, a money ball type of player. And so to see him even have a chance at this ball is encouraging. Shows good movement to his right. This is a tough throw, especially when you have a guy with wheels to try to get it there on target. Not easy to do. All right, now you you got to go. That's old school money ball. That's because <laughs> that one's been so long ago. Right. Because, now it's the new old school. I mean, what's what's the latest <laughs> money ball right now? Uh, the well, old money ball was on base percentage and all of that, but it's changed defensive metrics now. Baseball now, at least offensively, is swing as hard as you can in any count. Strikeouts are going up. And guys don't seem to care. That just seems to be kind of the new method of hitting. I've asked a lot of guys about this, a lot of hitting coaches, older guys that have been around. They said front offices are okay with it. They're okay with the strikeouts going up. And that's a great thing for pitchers. This is a nice time to be a pitcher because if you can execute, uh, you can do very well. But we see some big, big swings and two strikes that I don't remember seeing. Dietrich drives it in the gap, right center field. It gets down. Yelich racing for third. Brett Butler will send it. And he will score Dietrich on his way to third. And Miami draws within three. Darren Dietrich, the second time he's driven Yelich in on a two for three day. He crushed this ball. It wasn't a terrible pitch. It's down, but it's over the middle of the plate, but he didn't miss it. Listen, pitchers will make mistakes. Uh, it's good to see young pitchers, the young hitters not missing those mistakes. He drove this ball well in the right field gap. And you wonder on that cutoff right there as we see it on the replay, if that's one that you want Andrews and Simmons to take. And for Tommy Lestello, who hasn't worked with Simmons that much, not realizing probably go ahead, let that one go. Let Simmons take it. He has the better chance of maybe getting it out of third base or at least making it a close play. So far, Urban Santana has kept Giancarlo Stan in check. And it's been that pitch that he's used to do it, that sharp breaking ball. It's a good breaking ball. You just start to wonder, though, as well as Stan has been swinging the bat, is how many times can Urban Santana go to it before Stan makes an adjustment? This is a true test to what Stanton has worked on from day one. And it started with Frank Manichino as hitting coach in spring training, and that is don't try to do too much. You can drive in a run without hitting it 450 feet. There's Manichino. Braves infield is back. They'll give Miami another run for the ground ball, and Stanton did not go. And Stanton may have gotten a break. I think he may have. And it didn't put up any arguments, so, so maybe not. But you talked about you know, how last year was, and I think a lot of us, myself, I thought that this was going to be a very difficult year for Stan. Wasn't sure if he was going to have any protection. Nobody knew what to expect from Casey McGee hitting behind him. And so you anticipate that batting average was going to be low. Maybe the on-base percentage would have been high if he could be patient. But you didn't think he was going to get the pitches to hit. Casey McGee has done such a good job that he's forced pitching. He's pitching the pitchers to go just a little bit more, more strikes. Carlos Stan and he hasn't missed a lot of them and this, this year so far has turned out much better than I ever expected. But he is on deck. John Carlos Stan at the plate to count three and one. And he lost him. So Stan walks. And this is how McGee has made his living this year. You see Santana trying to throw that fastball away and it's Larry trying to try to come back to the middle of the plate. That ball continued just to cut away from Stan. And if you remember, back in the fourth inning, the Marlins started off with a triple and a single. Yellows and Dietrich both got on. And Santana did an outstanding job retiring the next three hitters to them on strikeouts. Well, now here in the sixth inning, same thing, although it's flipped around, a single and a triple. But now Stan walks this time, and this has the makings of a big inning. Just see, see some action. Stan in one corner, Dietrich at the other corner, and McGee takes a strike. We saw Barbro getting ready to right hander in the Braves pen. Casey McGee with runners in scoring position is the best in baseball. And for McGee, it's a it's a rather large sample size. 57 at bats. Braves infield looking for a ground ball. And McGee hits a fly ball. Right field, not too deep. Dietrich tags. Hayward has it. Here comes Dietrich and the throw, and he's in there. Miami has its second run of the inning, and it's a two-run game, 5-3.
Well, not exactly what the Marlins want, but I think Casey McGee will take it just a, an inch closer and chipping away at the lead, especially again what happened last time that he was in this situation, unable to get anything done. You talked about the Marlins in one position, how well they have hit, not just for Casey McGee, but this entire team. 279 over the year. That's third best in baseball, second best in the National League. A lot of, pop, a lot of people probably not anticipating that from this team. They've done a very nice job. And so Santana, who's managed this game magnificently into the sixth, has given up two runs. Jones at the plate, Stanton's running. And he got a good jump, but the ball's fouled back. I think people don't realize how well the big guy can run. Pete Carroll certainly did at <laughs> USC right. as a wide receiver and corner. At Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks, California, USC offered him a full ride to play football. And you can really tell that his legs are feeling good this year. He's healthy. Four for four in stolen base attempts on the season. You have a tendency to fall asleep on the big guys a little bit, even the athletic ones. And they have usually good base runners to catch off guard. And that's really what Stanton was in high school. He was an all-around athlete. He was a, a back-to-the-basket post player. For the basketball team, a wide receiver corner for the football team, a very good football team, and of course, uh, a tape measure hitting home run right fielder who really wasn't a, a, a big prospect in terms of uh, travel ball. He didn't play in a lot of the showcases because he was busy with other sports. Being an athlete, and that's one thing that scouts are discouraged about, is that a lot of players are being told as young as 12, 13 years old that they have to commit to one sport. That is ludicrous. Play every sport. There, there's reasons why there's seasons. A baseball season is plenty to develop. Allow your body to develop and do other things. Too many people thinking specialization is the way to go. You don't produce the best athletes by specializing at such a young age. If anything, you run the risk of burning them out. We just showed the, the graphic of all the Tommy John surgeries. And that's been one of the factors that I think everyone agrees on is the amount of pitches youngsters are throwing. Jones hits a ground ball to second. Estella Simmons to Freeman. Miami gets two back. Atlanta still up 5-3. Fox. Rays and Red Sox should be interesting tonight. Oh boy. And of course, Andrew McCutcheon of the Pirates and Yasiel Puig of the Dodgers. That's a terrific matchup as well. Major League Baseball doubleheader continuing.
big day of baseball on Fox 7 Eastern tonight. Comedies Caminero and Freddie Freeman. Freeman takes a, a swing and a miss. 5 3 ball game. Miami getting a couple runs back in the sixth. Freeman, Justin Upton, Chris Johnson, for Atlanta in the seventh. Jones, Caminero. Mike Redmond can get outs and innings from Archimedes Caminero. That would be an enormous shot in the arm. This is the part of Miami's bullpen that has struggled. Caminero, a brief stay with the Marlins this year and did not uh, have a lot of success, but back for a second round. He's retired all four that he's faced here in this ballgame. Well, it certainly is difficult, and you think about the Fitness of bullpen arms. I mean, you hear about almost any team that's in contention, how they'd love to add, be able to add another bullpen arm. Uh, it's very difficult to find relievers that can be consistent from year to year. And especially when you start to get to the bottom of your bullpen, your team's losing, but it's still somewhat early in the game. Finding guys to keep it close is not an easy thing. Justin Upton fouled that one off of Salt to Lamaki. Atlanta's strength, their pitching, the ERA, as we talked about, is the best in the National League. The Braves middle relief normally a strength and by comparison to other major league teams certainly not bad but when Jordan Walden went down with a hamstring injury the Braves suffered a bit it showed in Boston Walden along with the uh, variety of other Braves rehabbing trying to get back in Braves did make a move to bolster that middle relief and elevated their double A closer, Shea Simmons, 23 year old, is in that bullpen. How about Caminero, who's come in and retired five in a row? Simmons, if he were to come in, would be making his major league debut. He's a closer in double A, pitched at Missouri State. I got nervous he is. You see him moving, his legs are moving, his hands are moving. He, there's a part of him that cannot believe that he has that uniform on right now, especially to come straight from double A at such a young age and just anxious to get in that first game. And knowing this probably isn't going to be the one, unlikely he's going to get a close game with the team winning early on. But look at, look at those knees. Oh, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm here. I really want to pitch. <laughs> just really exciting. And those are those are good memories. Freddie, those, uh, those are times when you're pretty nervous. Freddie Gonzalez described him as he's a, he's a small guy who throws absolute heat. And is filthy. And I said, that sounds like your your closer, Craig Kimbrell. He said, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, he's kind of Kimbrell like. That went into center field. That's the last thing anybody in the National League East wants to hear is that they have another Craig Kimbrell type that could potentially turn into a setup man. Well, and that's just in comparison yeah. body type and, and sure and stuff. But the the year he was having. 14 of 14 save opportunities and an ERA of 0.78. Here is Simmons as he follows the Johnson base hit. Chris Johnson finally getting a hit. He had punched out three times against Jacob Turner. Simmons an 0 for 3. Simmons part of that uh, talented group. Of infielders, shortstops coming from Curacao and, and the Netherlands Antilles, the group that played on that Netherlands team in the World Baseball Classic. Jonathan Scope, Jurgsen Profar, Xander Bogerts, the uh, they just saw him in Boston. All four of those guys were on that team. Of course, Simmons was the, uh, the shortstop on that ball club. And the treat for all of them is that they all grew up idolizing Andrew Jones. <laughs> He's the one. And Andrew Jones is a brave in that ball off the glove of Garrett Jones. And Johnson's going to run a while. I don't know if Garrett Jones just flat out missed it. But it's a two base error. Well, at first glance it certainly did appear that way. The ball hit his glove and it didn't seem like he necessarily had to come very far off the back to get it. Some sloppy play here. Yeah, I mean it's not not a perfect throw, but certainly a very catchable throw. 
Derek Jones looked like he may have just taken his eye off of it. And Johnson could just stretch him out at that point. And so Caminero with a 2 0 count on Simmons. And the Braves a chance to get one of those runs back here. Yeah, they all grew up idolizing Andrew Jones. The Superstation was in full swing. And of course, Jones from that, that island area. Jones was the captain of that ball club. That's very cool. Andrew Jones, teammate of mine, great player, great teammate. And still in Japan. And still in Japan, getting it done and having a good year. And you talk about, I mean, you know that he loves baseball to do that. Because this guy had a great career, career, made a lot of money. He doesn't have to go to Japan, but he wants to continue to play and experience different cultures and have fun with it. It's not for everybody, but it's it's interesting. He's probably one of the biggest names, if not the biggest, for Major League Baseball to go over and play. Japan and, and to me that just shows you that he has a passion to play the game and he loves doing it and he's not ready to give it up. Caminero walks Simmons. And here's uh, Tommy Lastella who was one for two. I guess one question the Braves have to address as they get to July and move towards September and what they hope is October is what do they do with Dan Ugla? Because Ugla still has another year and a lot of money left on his contract. He was left off the postseason roster last year. And he just has been unable to find that stroke again this year. Well, it's an interesting question because the Atlanta Braves are not a team that is going to eat money. It's just not what they do. It's not part of their economic plan. But it's gotten to the point where he has been non productive. There's nothing they can do with him. Because of the length of the contract, I just don't see them ever letting him go. Lestella in the right field. That's a base hit. And the kid knocks in a run. Simmons on his way to third. And it's Atlanta back up by three. Well, for Lestella, he's not struck out yet. And as Freddie Gonzalez said, he just gives Atlanta a different look. A high on base percentage guy. And the Braves are, are desperately in need of that in their lineup. And doing it from the left side, which also helps in taking advantage of the hole with Simmons on first base and Garrett Jones holding him on. He sees that hole there and he does a nice job of turning on this ball, getting that ground ball through, picking up an RBI for himself, another base hit. And again, this is why he is here. He is here to produce offense. He's not going to come in and hit a bunch of home runs. That's not what he does. But he finds ways to get on base. And Hopefully, the Braves hope that they can get average defense out of him. This is kind of an audition for him right now. Can he be the answer, at least at the guy that they're comfortable with as they make a run at this division? And so far, so good. The MLB fan cave is back. Some of baseball's biggest stars scheduled to visit and appear. I think C.J. Nikowski in two weeks will be there. <laughs> in fan cave videos, check out the latest cave happenings. MLBFanCave.com. Follow at MLBFanCave on Twitter. And like MLB Fan Cave on Facebook. I had wondered for the Atlanta Braves as they looked at second base before Tommy Listella had gotten here if Ricky Weeks could have been an option for them. Guy in Milwaukee not playing second base. They really like Scooter Jeanette. He doesn't want to go to the outfield. Thought maybe that could kind of be, you know, a pending free agent. That might have been an interesting potential matchup there, even though those are two teams that expect to see each other or could see each other in the postseason. I wonder if they start looking outside the organization if he might have been a potential fit. Well, there was a middle infielder, not necessarily a second baseman, who was on the market up until a couple of weeks ago. Stephen Drew. But he's now off the market. And a bit pricey. But uh, not nearly as pricey as he was in coming out of spring training. <laughs> Well, that's why you wonder what options the Braves have maybe been considering as you look at what kind of production they've gotten out of their second baseman offensively. I think Steven Drew for them, they might have waited until after the June 5th deadline where there's no more draft pick compensation attached to him, and maybe they would have went down that path, but they didn't get that far. The Boston Red Sox did they didn't. Tommy Nero strikes out Gerald Blair. Atlanta gets a run back. 6-3. Braves on top.
Sports One returns tonight. Full card, epic bouts. Seventh rank, Stipe Miocic taking on Fabio Maldonado. Coverage begins with the pre-fight show tonight, 7 Eastern, on Fox Sports One, streaming live on Fox Sports Go. 6-3, Atlanta on top. The Braves a one-game lead in the East over the Marlins. This is something that Freddy Gonzalez did the other night, inserting Romero Pena into the ball game defensively for Tommy Lastella. Lastella had a nice ball game with the bat. He was two for three with an RBI. Anthony Barbaro comes into the game. Barbaro, the 29-year-old, gets Marcel Ozuna, Jared Saltalamacchia, and Danny Echeverria. Three-run lead, Braves on top. And now for the Braves, it's all about building a bridge to a Craig Kimbrell or adding on to the point where they don't need him. Yeah, and they have the guys to do that. You talked about how at times that can be a little bit of a stretch for the Marlins, but Barbaro has been very good at 2.95 ERA. 23 strikeouts to just three walks. That is an outstanding ratio. Those are very good for the Braves. Ozuna has uh, walked and struck out. It speaks to the organizational depth pitching wise the ability for the Braves to react quickly in spring training. And of course the plethora of available arms that come out of St. John's University like Barbaro has <laughs> myself every once in a while we turn out a product and hang in the big leagues but now he has been uh, very very good for this team. And I, I'm sure that he's making contributions. <laughs> Just like you are to the uh, the Red Storm baseball program. That's right. Now they were not the Red Storm when I was there. We were we were still the Red. But they have since changed. One two. Ozuna in the right field. Hayward is there. And he makes a catch. Let's go back to Los Angeles. Rob Stone with this game break. Rob. Yeah, Rob, that'll be a, it'll be interesting to see who gets tossed, <laughs> if anyone gets thrown at. Last night was a wild scene. It was with the Red Sox and the Rays. David Price hitting Big Poppy, John Farrell, and then almost his entire coaching staff was ejected <laughs> at that point. I wonder, you know, as a coaching staff, you know, the manager get kick, gets kicked out. The bench coach is now the acting manager. I just wonder if they had a pecking order. When the bench coach got kicked out, I say, "All right, you're third, you're fourth, because as the guys get getting kicked out of the game, they made it down to four. I think Greg Colburn was uh, <laughs> the guy left managing the team. Yeah, never thought he'd uh, get any managerial experience this year, but he certainly did. But the interesting thing for me in all that was that David Ortiz was very upset, and he had some very strong words for David Price after the game, saying he has zero respect for him going forward, and you just wonder if something's going to happen because." The Rays never hit anybody. They took a shot at Longoria, but they missed him. And it does, I don't know if that's enough for David Ortiz. I don't know if he feels like he hasn't gotten the payback that he deserves. And was that residue in your mind from Yunel Escobar and the beef with Johnny Gomes and, and the Red Sox bench? I guess. I mean, it didn't make a ton of sense to me at that point, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I thought the whole dust up was unnecessary. It's a five, not a five run lead. You absolutely can still steal in that situation against the Boston Red Sox. They have since come back from a five, not a five run deficit. So uh, I think it was more about the Red Sox being upset that they were playing bad at the time and taking their frustrations out on the Rays. And then guys almost getting hurt because of it. Well, the Red Sox certainly took their frustrations out on the Braves. They did. And winning two. In Atlanta, winning two in Boston. But the Braves have bounced back, beating Miami last night and leading here 6 3. Of course, Salta Lamaki can tell you about uh, the Rays Red Sox rivalry. Salta Lamaki, a former Brave, a briefly a, a Brave, then to Texas. Of course, ending up in Boston and winning a, a world championship. 
You have to wonder if the Boston Red Sox miss him just a little bit. There has been some noise about how A.J. Brzezinski has fit in over there with the Boston Red Sox. I've read some things that weren't the most complimentary. I wonder if they miss Salto a little bit. 3-2. It's in, and Salta La Mafia walks. Bottom seven in Miami, Freddy Gonzalez. And the Braves have a three-run lead. Well, certainly not what Freddy wanted to see. You never want to see walks late in the game. Really not anticipating that from Barbaro, who's been so good. That is just his fourth walk on the season. And this is 22nd game pitch on the year. Echeverria now, who is one for two. To right, Hayward has it. A long out, and there are two outs here in the seventh. And Reed Johnson will take the pinch hit appearance. Johnson a brave last year. Terrific pitch hitter last year, and he's continued that as a Marlin. Depressive. It is not easy to do to sit on the bench the entire game, not be in the flow of the game, not be getting consistent at bats and trying to keep yourself sharp. Think about some of the great pitch hitters, guys like Lenny Harris. All time. Mark Sweeney, who I think is second, if I'm not mistaken. It's very, very difficult to do. So Reed Johnson, a very valuable piece for this team. And bringing some veteran leadership as well, even though he's on the bench. I'd love to have a guy like that. Dan Jennings in Miami's bullpen. This was a rough day for Jacob Turner. Discussion going on between Johnson and the home plate umpire, Quinn Walcott, on that first pitch. I bet you that Johnson was a little bit frustrated because generally, and it's not an automatic rule, but generally for pinch hitters, they're looking for something early in the count. Because they're not getting consistent at bats, they really don't want to hit with two strikes. It can be very difficult for them to do. And so rarely will you see a pinch hitter let a fastball for a strike go by early in the count. It has always kind of been uh, the approach of pitchers, of veteran pitchers, to come in and throw an off-speed pitch early in the count because of exactly for that reason, try to counteract it. So I think when he saw that fastball call for a strike, he was upset because knowing in this situation, he's probably not going to let one get by. Well, now he has to hit 0 and 2. And Salt to Lamaki at first. A little jam shot. And Freeman picks it up, steps on the bag. Barbaro, a clean seventh. Braves by three in Miami.
a three run lead in the eighth in Miami. And in the third inning, the big blow, Freddie Freeman was on an 0 for 29 skid against Miami. Sent one into the corner, drove in two, and the Braves were off and rolling. And that is your King Play of the Day, brought to you by Burger King. First hit, first RBI against the Marlins this year. But he's had many before, many big ones, many damaging ones in his young big league career. Well, your first thought is how could it be over 29 for a guy that is this good and who had gotten off to such a great start. But as you know you see these guys every day this pitching staff especially the starting staff was really really good. Uh, and it still is continues to be good. I mean obviously they're missing Jose Fernandez but these guys were bringing it four deep. And I think that's what made some people believers in the Marlins as a you know the team that could potentially contend and they still have a chance it'd be a little bit harder now but they still have a chance. Romero Pena over the head of Echeverria. Yelich cuts it off. And Pena has a base hit to lead off the eight. Pena in that double switch in the nine spot. Jason Hayward, BJ Upton coming up as well. And just like I had said earlier about Reed Johnson for Pena, yes, he went into the field defensively, but essentially that's like pinch hitting. He comes in hitting for the first time in the eighth inning, jumping on the first pitch right away, not wanting to get deep in the count, getting a pitch he can handle, and he hit that one very hard. Now Jason Hayward. Hayward's been on base twice. He drove in two with a single in the fourth. This is the time of year where everybody's schedule gets a little weird in terms of uh, interleague play. The Braves, after this weekend, return home. They've got two games against Seattle. Just for two, huh? Just for two. Down the left field line, the Marlins kick off their four game set against the Rays. Two here in Miami, two in St. Pete. Hey, he's got two baseballs. Have a, a bunch of balls. Have a day, kid. Look at him. And he's not sharing either. I love it. His buddy wants when he told him to beat it. <laughs> That's great. Uh oh. Good rivalry going on here. How does he not sharing right there? Well, one of his buddies had a ball. Oh, two. Dietrich gets it out, and Echeverria will hold it as Hayward hustles down the line. MLB.tv Premium is the number one live streaming sports service, and it's celebrating. 12 years. Millions of subscribers have jumped in. You can watch every out of market game live in true HD on over 400 devices. Go to MLB.com for details. Major League Baseball and Fox Sports 1, of course, tonight. More baseball on Fox. Two very interesting matchups. You see you with the Pirates and the Dodgers. You've got two premier outfielders there, Yasiel Puig and Andrew McCutcheon. Whereas Rob Stone called it round two <laughs> of Rays Red Sox. DJ Upton lines it foul. Upton. Two for four. Avila on the lefty. David Carpenter, the right hander. It's funny, every time you, you cut down to that bullpen camera, you can hear the, uh, the Clevelander. <laughs> so it's always crowded, regardless of who's in town. Is it always a, uh, always a party out there every home game? It was such a party. Let's go down there again. There it is. Tuesday night. Oh yeah, really? Oh yeah. <laughs> but a little more so on Saturday. It was such a party that Miami's bullpen was there in year one. 
Uh, I did not know that. <laughs> and because of the distractions, uh -huh. the Marlins moved their bullpen over to right field. <laughs> Makes sense. Ooh. I guess I should have realized that, realizing that these bullpens are opposite, almost like they used to be in San Diego because you couldn't see them at the old ballpark. They were down the line so far that. You were actually on the opposite side of your team. And that added to the concern, <laughs> along with the distractions, is the Marlins couldn't see the bullpen uh, from their dugout. That's great. That is really funny. Reminds me a little bit. Seattle has a very similar situation. Their bullpen's in left field. There's I'm not sure exactly what it is out there, but some kind of bar that moves you a crowd and they come right up against you. DJ Upton strikes out. So Dan Jennings now gets Freddie Freeman. Talking about Giancarlo Stanton and the fact that he was a, a three sport athlete coming up in Southern California, he did play on an area code team and for a brief time, his teammate was Freddie Freeman. And they weren't buddies and, and all that, but they didn't know each other and they ended up going just two picks away in the draft. Freeman. And Stanton were both second round draft picks. The Braves in the first round of that draft took Jason Hayward. Wow. Great draft for them. The Marlins had ah. scouted Hayward, liked Hayward, but had a glaring need at third base. And two picks before Hayward took Matt Dominguez, who is now starting to blossom with the Houston Astros. And as well, Miami knew. Or at least had a really good idea that Stanton would be available for their second round pick. So they decided to go a third baseman and then an outfielder. Well, it's amazing to think that Stanton could go that low, seeing the superstar, both of these guys for that matter, and seeing the superstars that they've turned into. But as the draft comes up here in a couple of days, it's not like the other sports draft. It's not like. Uh, First round picks are guaranteed to be superstars. They don't come out of college programs that are just a step below uh, the major league sport like they do in football, like they do in basketball. It really is a completely different animal. And it's a development sport. And it's so fun because you get guys that come out of the 40th round and become everyday big leaguers. Not often, but it happens. And that's what makes that major league baseball draft so unique. Freeman and Stanton both 24. Hayward's on the move. Salt Lavaki's throw is in. To center field, and the Braves have run wild here in this ball game. That's their third stolen base for Hayward, his ninth of the season. Pretty good jump right here by Jason Hayward. You see him pick peek in like you're supposed to do. A good throw, probably not going to happen. When you're stealing a base against a left-handed pitcher, a lot of base runners. Are going to likely go first. They're going to guess. They're going to guess that you've already decided to throw home. And when they do that, they get a great jump, and it's very difficult to throw those guys out. 2 2 to Freeman. I was thinking about what you said about Stan playing multiple sports and being a, a player down in the post in basketball, a tight end, right? You said in football. Oh, no, wide receiver. Oh, excuse me, wide corner. receiver. That's unbelievable. And then thinking, okay, if you had to go up against him in any sport, you had to pitch against him, you had to post him up, or you had to play defense on him and let him post you up, or you had to cover him, which one would you least likely want to do? And all of the above is not an option. I have a feeling he would have ended up at, at tight end for USC had he committed. For even walks and for Jennings. Now he has to face a, a really good right handed bat in Justin Upton. I just couldn't imagine having to play defense on that big body while he's posting you up and just running you over. Mike Redmond on his way out to the mound. And Redmond's going to go and get Chris Hatcher to face Upton. In the eighth, Atlanta. A 6 3 lead and a pitching change for Miami.
Get tonight on Fox Rays Red Sox after last night's wild one. And Andrew McCutcheon and Yasiel Puig have a date. Dodgers Pirates. Major League Baseball doubleheader continuing tonight, 7 Eastern on Fox. Here this afternoon, indoors with the roof closed and the windows shut and the AC on. Atlanta comfortable with a 6 3 lead in the eighth. And the Braves have a couple runners aboard. Chris Hatcher out of Miami's pen. Hatcher, a converted catcher. And there are a lot of converted catchers yeah. that turn into pitchers, but Hatcher is the only one in the last almost 70 years that got to the big leagues as a catcher for a cup of coffee and then converted and got back as a pitcher. Now what a journey. All those years of having to put up with pitchers. This can be frustrating and annoying and then turning into one. And he gets Justin Upton and the reason that Mike Redman made that switch is that Upton has big numbers against lefties. Hatcher throws hard 96 the secondary stuff there are the splits. I think that would be big numbers. And those are and listen that those numbers against righties are not bad either. I mean it's not like there is a awful batting average when he's facing right handed hitters. There's just that gaudy 438 against lefties which is terrifying for any left hander sitting down. The bullpen. High fastball. That's one and two. Craig Kimbrell has worked two nights in a row. The last game in Boston. And uh, Kimbrell last night nailing down the save in a 3 2 ball game. Braves would like to be able to add a few runs and uh, maybe give Kimbrell the night off. It is night now here in Miami. Four o'clock start in the afternoon. Hatcher with a breaking ball and he takes care of Justin Upton. But Miami has work to do down 6 3 to the Braves. Three runs better than the Marlins in the bottom of the eighth inning. Atlanta goes deeper into their bullpen. Miami has the top of their order up. Christian Yelich against Luis Avila, and Yelich bunts, but he bunts it too hard and an easy out. Yelich three for three going into that at bat.
And Derek Dietrich comes up. Avila at an opportune time in the order because he's got Yelich and Dietrich slotted one and two. It's an interesting choice there for me by Yelich. He's done a good job against lefties this year. He's hitting 333 against lefties and only 219 against righties. And yes, you're looking for base runners right now, and that's something that he has been working on with Brett Butler, trying to get bunting for a hit down, something he can have in his tool bag. But it's like an unusual time to try it. Tough to, tough to bunt off lefties. That's one of the dimensions that Brett Butler has added to the ball club. Base running, base stealing, and bunting it with a couple of players. Dietrich swings and misses. Dietrich RBI single, RBI triple. The damage for Miami has come from the top of their order. Yelich scoring twice and having three hits. Dietrich scoring a run and he has two hits. Both have triples. No swing. Jerry Davis, crew chief. Tomorrow the calendar turns. And two months will be in the books. The major League schedule. A third of the way there. I think some teams start to realize what they have, what their legitimate chances are, what needs they may have, and start to formulate that plan and say, are we going to need to add here in the next six or seven weeks from outside the organization of what guys will be available? I think the the race for Jeff Samarja will be on. David Price potentially is need to get thrown out there if the race continue to sink. There are some big leads right now in, in baseball. The Giants have a seven and a half game lead over the Rockies. San Francisco just keeps winning ball games. They've won four in a row. Actually, they had that four game win streak snaps. By the Cardinals. The Rockies, of course, a, a great start. Rockies lost to Cleveland today. The Dodgers have a chance to take over sole possession in the West with a win against the Pirates tonight. Tigers, five and a half up at start of play in the Central. Just when St. Louis got close to Milwaukee, the Brewers went off and, and had a nice run. Though Milwaukee is losing to the Cubs 7 0. And if they lose, St. Louis will be three back in the Central. I think we all kind of expect St. Louis to be the team out of that division, but they have just struggle to score runs that has been their biggest issue they still have that great young pitching and of course they have Adam Wainwright you wonder with Oscar Devaris getting the call today and hitting a home run on his first big league game if he maybe could provide the punch that a guy like Gassio Puig did last year for the Los Angeles Dodgers that pitch as it crossed the plate and it did catch the plate on the black and at the letters Freddie Gonzalez was already on his way out to the mound because he doesn't want the lefty to face Giancarlo Stanton. Stanton will get a right hander when we return.
David Carpenter came in and got an out last night in the Braves one run win. And he is in for John Carlos Stanton. Although right now Atlanta a little more comfortably on top 6 3. Bottom eight Carpenter's numbers. Bumped up a bit. By his outing in Boston. The last night the Braves were there. He gave up a couple runs when the Red Sox came back to tie the game. At 3 3 and ended up walking off with the win. Well, here he has an opportunity. Like he said, a little bit less pressure. This is almost a freebie. Uh, we know how good Stan is. We know about the power. We use the phrase a lot of times go ahead, let's see how far he can hit. And we know he can hit it far, but that's how you treat it. What you don't want to do is give a free pass and, and open up an inning with two outs and nobody on. Have to face Casey McGee, who's been very good against right handers. Go right at Gene Carlos Stanton. If he crushes one, so be it. But you just don't want to give. The Marlins, any life right here by issuing a free pass. He's been able to get a couple of strikes. It's two and two. And it's almost like this is kind of like a scouting trip almost to some degree because, yes, it's a big situation, and but at the same time, somebody was just tossed around oh. Miami's dugout. Rob Leary, the bench coach, was tossed. Now his manager Mike Redman is in tow. Normal protocol is umpires won't let guys that aren't the manager talk out. Here's Fox tracks on that last pitch. That was it looks a little bit low, but I thought it wasn't that questionable. And especially a lot of times you're behind the cat, you might get that call. It looked like maybe because of the way that Laird caught it, it maybe didn't look as high as it was. But I thought that crossing played about knee high. So Leary has been tossed. Two two Stanton a rifle shot in the left. And so Stanton is aboard. Here comes Casey McGee. Not a lot of time to react. <laughs> Now when he hits a matter look at them both looking at each other like Simmons, <laughs> Simmons did not even take a step. And he looks over at Johnson like you couldn't get that. He's like I couldn't get it. And neither one of them had a chance. Stan had a hundred and thirteen mile an hour single on that West Coast trip. I believe it was in San Diego. That is so ridiculous. <laughs> That's absurd. McGee liner right field down the line. Stanton around second. Hayward into the corner. They will send Stanton and around thirty comes. Relay throw home and he scores. And Miami has a run here in the bottom of the eighth. And it's Casey McGee who has driven in two and now has 34 on the season. Well, Casey McGee continues to do a really nice job of hitting behind Stanton, taking that line drive approach, not letting this park beat him. It's a fastball down the middle, even a little bit in, but he keeps the hands in, drives that ball strongly to right field. And now for the Atlanta Braves, things start to get a little bit dicey. Time run comes to the plate. The Braves had that opportunity to add on and stretch the three-run lead. Now it's a two-run lead with McGee in scoring position and Garrett Jones at the plate. Braves have had a couple of chances. They left the bases loaded earlier in the game. That was back in the fourth inning. Even though they're winning this game, they have left 10 guys on base. Outfield very deep. Carpenter misses away. It's 2 0. Oh. Tight run at the plate. Jones has hit eight home runs. At a 2 0 pitch. Garrett Jones, one of those guys that spent a long time battling his way to the big leagues. And you just talked about how the outfield is playing deep, and you can see it right here. And they call it kind of a no doubles defense because what you don't want to do is you don't want to allow Jones to hit a ball over an outfielder's head and become the tying run, get, get put in scoring position so that outfield plays a little bit deeper. Dumps that one into the seats. 
27,000 here on a Saturday afternoon, turning into a gorgeous evening in Miami. Carpenter's 2 2. Jones fights off another one. Nine years in the minor leagues until he finally got his first big league taste back in 2007. 31 games with the Twins. And a real nice run in Pittsburgh. Takes incredible perseverance. Of what it's like to, you know, what it's like to be in the minor leagues. It's uh, it's easy to get lost and it's it's easy to lose focus of that dream. Bus rides, bad meal money, bad hotels. The uh, very difficult. Times. Jones, of course, part of that ball club that finally turned the corner in Pittsburgh. A winning season, an appearance in the postseason. 3 2 coming. It's way out. No one throwing in Atlanta's bullpen, but I think that's about to change. Roger McDowell on his way out to the mound. Well, David Carpenter has come in and he's faced three hitters. He has not been able to get any of them out. We saw the hard single from Stanton, the hard line drive by McGee to right field for a double, and now a walk to Jones. Talked about him having a rough outing. You know, you'd like to come back and have a good one. And there has been times when Freddie Gonzalez has been criticized for not going to Craig Kimball a little bit earlier. But you just talked about how he's pitched two days in a row. So ideally, you really would want to bring him in and give him. Mike Redmond, on the other hand, checking his lineup card. Redmond, unaware when we uh, reminded him that this is the anniversary of his major league <laughs> debut back in 1998. Redmond was called up. By Jim Leland, and he was three for three with a home run, and then he got pinch hit for <laughs> in uh, in the later stages of that game. And he oh, said, I, "I couldn't be angry because number one, I was in the big leagues, and number two, it was Jim Leland." Yeah, and he already had a home run, so he's flying high as it was. Well, we we thought we might see Shea Simmons, and there he is, just called up. Maybe he'll make his big league debut. Uh, on a scale from one to a billion, how fast this is hard beating right now. That, but listen, when you warm up anytime, I don't care how long you've been around the game, you automatically have an accelerated heart rate. Do it as a rookie. Potential go ahead runs on base. You can see the smile on his face as he's warming up as he just threw one away right there. This kid is uh, he's excited right now, to say the least. Marcelo Zuna at the plate. Well, Zuna broken back, shallow center. It's going to fall a base hit. McGee around third. It's a one run game. A tough break for Carpenter right there. We heard the broken bat. That is the downside of playing your outfield deep in these situations and playing the no doubles defense is that you risk balls falling in, and that is exactly what happened right here. Anything that gets over an outfielder's head is probably going to be at least two runs. So you can't allow that to happen. DJ opted. No, maybe a little bit of a late break. The broken bat fools you sometimes. The ball looks like it's hit harder than it actually was. So maybe a little bit of a slow step. Probably can't get that ball in a rough outing. Well, in 1998, Mike Redmond made his major league debut. Chase Simmons is about to do it here.
hard throwing right hander who makes his major league debut a 23 year old rookie Shea Simmons the closer in double A in just his third year as a pro Jared Salt to Lamakia in a one run game takes a fastball for a strike 94 miles an hour if you're a kid at home and you play video games and you get that one where the, the controller starts vibrating in the really tense situation that is what's happening right now on the inside of Shea Simmons. This is a memory, good or bad, that he will have forever. This is a great moment. Miami has scored twice here in the bottom of the eighth. And it's he a one run have, game. He will have made his major league debut on the same day as Redmond. What a nice memory for him. They'll both forget it together. I don't know if he's going to forget this. Uh -huh. No chance. Well, to Lamacchia, quickly behind in the count, 0 and 2. And here's how you know he's nervous. It is humid in here, and it's blowing on his hands like it's cold. Like he doesn't even know what his body is doing right now as he throws that 96 mile an hour fastball right by Salta Lamacchia. Well, he's got a hitter that's cold right now. Salta Lamacchia 0 for his last 15 with seven strikeouts. 0 2 coming. Got him. Breaking ball. Welcome to the show, kid. That's awesome. Jay Simmons with a hook strikes out Salt to the Machia. One run game in Miami. Major League debut comes in a one run game in the bottom of the eighth with the tying and the go ahead runners on, and he strikes out Jared Saltalamaki. And now he can exhale and he gets a hug from Tommy Lestella, who just got promoted to the big leagues as well. Geico brings you the in game box score for the Braves. BJ Upton continues to swing a hot bat. Jason Hayward is knocked into Freddie Freeman, a two run double. And the Listella single in the seventh is the difference in this ball game right now. It sure is, and you, didn't, you sure didn't think it at the time. You kind of wondered with the Braves bullpen, were the Marlins, would they have any chance of coming back in this game? But they've done a nice job, but not quite all the way there just yet. Johnson takes a strike. AJ Ramos into the ball game for the Marlins. Ramos. And Mike Dunn have kind of been the most dependable bullpen guys for Miami, leading into Steve Cisha. 0 oh 2, Johnson, 1 for 4, three strikeouts in a single. Trying to avoid that uh, golden somewhere, <laughs> that fourth strikeout.
What's the pitcher's equivalent of a golden Ooh, That's a good question. Uh, that start where you don't get out of the first inning, maybe. Or for, there's, there's no article of clothing. There's no article of clothing, you know, for Carpenter not getting an out and coming in with two outs and never being able to get an out. McGee throws out Johnson. Ramos has an out in the ninth. We talked about could the Braves get through this game without getting Kimbrell up. He's up and he's ready. Miami will have 8 9 1. That Chaburia. Pitcher spot and then Yelich. And if anybody reaches, Dietrich and Stanton. Maybe for Simmons. It'll be part of a Braves win. Oh, that would be great to come in that situation, get your first hold. You know what he doesn't want to happen here is the Braves score a bunch of runs and he actually has to go back out there. But they, they put four or five on the board because there is such an adrenaline rush in this situation that you come down pretty heavy the first time. And you can see him there. He's still breathing heavy. Uh, probably not sure exactly where he is and what just happened. Uh, it would be nice if, uh, if they, the Braves could almost kind of keep it here should they'd like to add on, but give Kimbrell a little bit of cushion, but let him let him finish it out. That a low strike call as well. And that was the pitch that uh, Quinn Walcott turned and tossed Rob Leary out of the ball game for. It was on, on a Giancarlo Stanton at bat. Here it's Andrelton Simmons who was 0 for 3 with a walk. What the heck's going on? Simmons has walked <laughs> twice in this series. And there was a similar pitch to Chris Johnson as well in his last at bat that I thought was a little bit low. And you just wonder if Quinn Walcott trying to justify. That call to stand the zone seems to have gotten a little bit lower. In the air. Jones over and he lunges. But that's three rows in. And a souvenir. One and two to Simmons. So Kimbrell's heating up. And it could be a, a historic night for Kimbrell. If he were to come in and, and get the save, he would tie John Smoltz as the Braves' all time save leader. Smoltz, 154 career saves. Kimbrell is just one shot. Well, I think we all knew this was coming sooner or later, whether it happens tonight or not. Uh, I think he's going to pass that record and he's going to pass it pretty far. I mean, this is one of those things. John Smoltz only closed for a couple of years. Yeah, Smoltz had such a, a unique career as a, a lights out starter and closer. Check swing, dribbler, and this could be a tough play. No play. Simmons has a hit. Simmons at first. CJ Nikowski racing back to his hotel because tonight is right. UFC Fight Night on Fox Sports 1. It's back with a full card of epic bouts. Seventh ranked Stipe Miocic taking on Fabio Maldonado. Coverage begins the pre fight show at 7 Eastern on Fox Sports 1, and it's streaming live on Fox Sports Go. That's tonight on Fox Sports 1. And we get a lot of those guys uh, floating around the studios of Fox Sports 1 in Los Angeles. It's a. Uh... It's an intimidating sight to see some of those UFC guys. Don't look them in the eye. Ryan Dolman takes the attack for the Braves. This is the pitcher spot. Freddy Gonzalez double switching. Tommy Lasella out. Lasella had a couple hits, including an RBI single in the seventh. Dolman, a former pirate, we were talking about Garrett Jones. Dolman was there a long time as well. Seven years in Pittsburgh, had two real nice years his last two years in Minnesota. It was interesting when he came over here to talk about the Braves, you know, having that third, you know, kind of flexible catcher, they're losing Brian McCann and what they were going to do. And Dolman was like, hey, 
I don't catch anymore. That's not, I don't do that anymore. That is not part of what I do. Uh, so don't bank on me coming, catching a bunch of games for you. Only in emergency, please. Yes. And I actually threw it in. He was another former teammate of mine that I played with back in 2006 when he was on his way up. Another guy good to see have a nice career. I just imagine your closet at home with about <laughs> nine different equipment bags from different major league organizations. At least nine. How yeah. many? Well, you know, I played for I played for eight teams in the major leagues, but I played for 11 organizations total. Uh, four of them I played for them twice. So I had two tours of duty with four of them, three teams in Korea, one in Japan, a couple in the Dominican Republic. The tally is a little bit over a thousand teammates over 19 years. Very fortunate. To Played the game and bounced around and, and meet a lot of great people. At the end of the day, that's one of my greatest memories is the teammates and the people and the memories that you get to share with guys as you all chase the same dream. Dolman takes out and he walks, and Ramos has run into some difficulty here in the ninth. Gerald Laird coming to the plate. Chuck Hernandez, he certainly has his hands full and has done a, a terrific job so far. The Marlins, as we noted, have, have the youngest team in baseball. They have an extremely young rotation, a young bullpen. Although the rotation will get a shot in the arm as far as uh, experience in years when Randy Wolf rejoins <laughs> the rotation. Bumps up that average age just a little bit. Wolf scheduled to start Monday against the Rays. They're not happy with that one. And Walcott know about it. Kimbrell is heated up and is now sitting down. It's, a, it's really amazing to watch Kimbrell and what a contrast. Remember the scene with. With the the kid out there, Shea Simmons was fidgeting and, and <laughs> didn't know what to do with his hands, and his feet were moving a mile a minute. And yet you see Kimbrel, who's been through it and knows certainly what Simmons just went through. One one. Which every pitcher will tell you to some degree that they still get a little nervous, regardless of how experienced that they are. Uh, there is always something to that game adrenaline and knowing you're going to go out there and pitch in a big league game. I mean, some of the best that I played with, guys that had tremendous careers, always get that little bit of nervous. They said there would be something wrong if you didn't feel at least a little something before you went into the game. One, two, foul back to the screen. It's just that kind of energy that you have to make sure that you can control it and command it and it doesn't overcome you. Uh, the kind that propels you to do well as opposed to the kind of adrenaline that can lock you up a little bit. Kind of like when you're playing golf. Think about when you're playing golf and you're standing over that putt thinking about it too much and you shank it because you, you outthink yourself. That happens to relievers too. Laird is up. Atlanta trying to add on near the top of the ninth in a one run game. Ramos. With a one two. A liner in the left field, and that's a base hit. Yelich to cut it off, and the Braves now have a two run cushion. Gerald Laird, an RBI hit, and they get to Miami's bullpen again. You see that slider that Laird did not like earlier in the count, that pitch that he thought was in. This is actually a pretty good pitch from Ramos. He located it away. They're just doing a good job, not getting fooled too much, keeping the bat in the zone, driving the ball to left field. It's tough enough to get one run against Craig Kimbrell. Now Miami is faced with at the very least having to get two. And you wonder what would happen if they were, if the Atlanta Braves were able to add both of these runs and it becomes a non save situation. If Freddie Gonzalez would still stick with K Craig Kimball. He's thrown two days in a row, and he's already gotten all the way hot. He really should have tomorrow off, no matter what, whether he pitches in this game or not. So I wonder if Freddie's thinking he's going to lose him. A bunt by Pena, a beauty. And another run scores, and another error on the Marlins. Holding third. 
is Laird. Miami has thrown it around the ballpark. Three errors. And they all have been key ones. This should have been an out regardless. I think Assalto Lamakia makes a good throw here. He's going to get Pena, but he just rushes and you see his feet kind of get caught under him. He doesn't quite get them set when he makes that throw. And he pulls it up the line just a little bit. You keep an eye on Pena, make sure that he is in the he's in the line and he's uh, it's close. He's got to be in between those two lines when he's running up the baseline. But the throw was so far away from him, the point was moot. Yeah. And that's the third error. It's a throwing error. Sacrifice bunt for Pena. And here's Hayward. And this inning is spiraling out of control for A.J. Ramos. Miami will walk Hayward, bring up B.J. Upton. Well, a two run bottom of the eighth made it a one run game, and that didn't last long. I know the Braves didn't light it up last night. They scored three runs on eight hits, and that was enough. But Freddy Gonzalez, this has to feel good to put some crooked numbers up. Eight runs, a dozen hits. A three-run third, a two-run fourth, and now two here in the ninth. This team is capable of putting up big runs. They just haven't been consistent. They're not quite the team they were last year. Last year, there were home runs in that lineup. And they led the league in strikeouts, as you talked about, but they were always capable of putting up that 8 to 10 spot. It necessarily hasn't been the case this year. But you're right. He does have to feel good. And now, as we saw, David Hale was warming up in the bullpen, and you have to imagine one more run comes across the board. And we're not going to see Craig Kendall. It's also a crossed up on that one right there. And he'll take a visit out to Ramos. A scary feeling as a pitcher. I mean, you can see, excuse me, as a catcher, he is anticipating a breaking ball right there. Ramos threw a fastball, and it actually might have been a strike, but because of the way that he caught it, I think it threw everybody off guard. You don't get the call from the home plate umpire. Yeah, he had turned the glove over, anticipating a breaking ball. Upton gets a 1 0 pitch, and it's in. B.J. Upton, two more hits in this ball game. The hits are starting to come. Two and one. Three Miami errors. The Marlins started the game. 14th in the National League. In errors. Which is not a good place to be. No, definitely not. And for a young team that has had has some good pitching and you're developing this pitching, you'd like to give good support defensively. It can be discouraging sometimes. I would feel like you do your job and you're not getting the support. Especially when you're trying to figure out trying to survive here at the major league level. And Ramos has walked in a run. And the wheels have really come off this inning. For Ramos. Kimbrell is uh, a much more relaxed pose, but he can't relax all the way. You never know what will happen in the bottom of the ninth if Miami were to bring the tying or go ahead. Runner up and uh, Mike Rebin has seen enough. Ramos has thrown 30 pitches, only 15 of them strikes. And for Ramos, who's been pretty dependable this year, a rugged ninth inning. Mike Rebin told us in his office that his bullpen is very thin and it's shown up tonight. Well, it could be difficult to manage, especially in a situation like this. Your team has climbed back in the game. You're, you're losing, so you may not go necessarily on most teams. Go right to your eighth inning guy, your seventh inning guy, but this is the situation they're in right now. 
Kevin Slowey comes in 9-5. Braves up by four. In Miami, the Braves have put three more on the board in the ninth and a 9 5 lead. Kevin Slowey out of Miami's pen. Freddie Freeman with the bags loaded. Backdoor breaking ball for a strike. And Lucas coming in in the double switch. Marcelo Zuna is out. Christian Yelich goes from left to center. And it counts one and one. For the Braves, nine runs. They Braves have not scored a lot of runs this year, so this has to feel good for Miami. A struggle keeping the Braves from adding on. Slowly having to exchange the ball. Freddie Freeman wanted a new baseball. So to Lamakia out to chat with the veteran right hander. For those of you tuning in for UFC Fight Night pre fight, we'll get you there immediately at the conclusion of this ballgame. In the meantime, the telecast is currently available on Fox Sports 2 and it's streaming live on Fox Sports Go on that app and at foxsportsgo.com. Crawls in to the inside part of the plate for a strike. Still kind of an interesting guy. He's had a couple of starts this year. Maybe looked at as kind of a swing man. Does not generate a lot of swings and misses. Just 17% of the pitches that are swung at are swung at him. It's at an extremely low rate. So with a guy like Freddie Freeman, you're almost guaranteed to get some kind of contact in this at bat. A couple walks and a two run double for Freeman. Part of a 12 hit night for the Braves. And the Marlins haven't supported their starter, Jacob Turner, or any of the relievers defensively. Miami has made three errors. AJ Ramos on the hook for three runs, two of them earned. Freeman out to short and Javaria flip. Dietrich's turn is in time. And Slowey gets a double play. But the run much bigger now. 9 5 Atlanta.
in Miami. You can follow every game with MLB.com at bat, your favorite mobile or tablet or device, live look-ins, instant replays, score stats, audio free, MLB.tv game of the day and more. Download on the App Store or visit MLB.com. Sort of a subdued crowd out there in the Clevelander. After a, an afternoon of dancing, they have seen the Braves put three on the board in the ninth. No Kimbrell. David Hale comes in and he's greeted with a line drive in the center field. And Danny Echeverria's second hit. I guess if you're Miami, one of the goals you have here is to try to get Kimbrell up again at the very least. I tell you what, Greg Kimbrell will not be happy if he has to get up again because he was up for a long time to begin with, uh, as it was for him. Uh, as that inning went long, he continued to go, and you try to pace yourself, and it can be very frustrating as a reliever, no matter how many times you've done it. If you feel like you're ready to go, you almost want the inning to end and just get out there. Uh, but if he has to get up again, uh, he is guaranteed he's not ready to have it. Lucas sprays it, and a nice play by Pena going to his left. So an out in the inning for Hale. Now he gets into the top of the order. Yelich, Dietrich, and then Stanton. And we can see it in the background. We see him there now. This is the non-fun part about being a closer. You know, you talked about John Smoltz earlier. I was in that bullpen with him in 2004 as a member of the Atlanta Braves. He hated this part. He had told me, he's like, this is the worst part of closing. I like doing it. I like being out there. But it's the uncertainty of getting up and the possibility of not going in the game. He really despised it. Because you need to stay heated. But at the same time, you don't want to burn your bullets because you'd like to be available tomorrow. It's really, really difficult. But like I said, for me, he almost definitely has tomorrow off if I'm coaching this team. He had five days off where he didn't pitch. And now this would have been three in a row. And that up and down, that feast or famine is very taxing on your arm. And a lot of people say, well, he didn't go in the game. Your adrenaline still got up. He's throwing a ton of pitches. He's probably thrown, you've seen him throw at least 40 or 50 pitches down there today, all told. It's all said and done. This is a 2-0 pitch. Well, maybe Freddie Gonzalez can use that new app that James Andrews That's right. That's right. has developed. That'll be out in a couple of weeks, and I am a huge advocate of that. As far as youth baseball goes and pitch counts, it's something that most coaches and most parents aren't educated on. And if you don't know about it, Google it. Dr. James Andrews has come up with a very useful app for yeah. youth baseball players. It's three and one to Yelich. We actually had that discussion with uh, with Freddie Gonzalez, and, and he said he'd heard about the app. And he said that the amazing thing about uh, youth baseball is oftentimes they will do with kids what Freddie would never do with a major league pitcher. And Yelich walks, and so here comes Freddie, and this is what he didn't want to do. He's going to go get Craig Kimbrell. We got the tying run on deck, and his name is Giancarlo Stanton. Here comes Kimbrell. He could tie John Smoltz's record with a save tonight.
not only chasing John Smoltz, chasing some history. He is one away from tying Smoltz. He's at 153, and he can get 154 if he can get two outs here. The tying run is actually on deck. I know it's a four run game, and it sounds odd, but this is a save situation. Jabri at second, Yelich at first, Dietrich is up. Now, Dietrich had a big hit against Kimbrell in one of his blown saves this year. It was a pinch hit double in Atlanta. The Braves eventually won that ball game on an Evan Gaddis walk off pinch hit double. Dietrich is tripled and single. This is not going to be an easy one, not only because he has to go through potentially hitters number number two and three outside of a double play and eventually facing the stand, but the fact of what he's done, he's pitched two nights in a row and he's warmed up a bunch, sat down thinking he wasn't going to pitch and then had to get up again in this ninth inning. It's been a, a taxing night before he even took the down. Fastball is up. It's been a, just an incredible start to Kimbrell's career. He's the most efficient strikeout pitcher in baseball history when it comes to, to strikeouts. His ERA has been minuscule since he became the closer. A 1 2 1 ERA last year with a run of 37 consecutive saves. Dietrich fouls one off. And the value of a guy like Kimbrell, especially at his age, the Braves recognize that a four year, $42 million deal. They have the best closer in baseball, and you talk about the strikeouts. More than 17 strikeouts per nine innings. That leads all of Major League Baseball. He knows how to finish hitters. He's trying to finish Dietrich. And when Kimbrell is coming up trying to get to Atlanta, you see Stanton on deck. Dietrich was already in Atlanta. He was playing for Georgia Tech. Shortstop. One, two. It's out. And it's two and two. Ninety seven miles an hour. You mentioned Georgia Tech. Frank Grant, the general manager of the Atlanta Braves, his son played. At Georgia Tech and was drafted, and it wasn't a favorite draft. I saw him play in college and, and thought he was pretty good. It wasn't, hey, my dad's the GM, and we're going to hook you up to kick and play a little bit. And he's done well so far in the minor leagues. 2 2. Nasty breaking ball. Down goes Dietrich, and Kimbrell is an out away from tying John Smoltz. Throw with that slider to go with that 97, 98 mile an hour fastball. That's why he strikes so many guys out. That breaking ball is so tight. It's not just about the velocity and his ability to blow the ball past guys, but it's that devastating breaking ball that he has to go with it. And he faces Stanton now, and even if Stanton hits one 400 feet, he'll still have the lead. One of the interesting things for me about Kimbrell's season so far is that coming into this game, he had 21 games pitched and only 19 and two thirds innings. It's rare that you see a closer who actually has less innings pitched than games. And if he finishes this one out, that'll remain intact. Stanton breaks his bat. Johnson to his left. And it's off the glove and out of the glove of Pena. Back to third is Echeverria. And the bags are loaded with two outs. We saw the Braves botch that play, a similar throw in Boston. It was right there for Pena to catch. He just flat out missed it. Johnson did a good job. He pretty good throw. I mean, maybe a tiny bit high, but you have to be pretty happy about the fact that you break Jim Carlos Stanton's bat. Looks like the game is going to be over. Pena just missed it. In Boston, Johnson left his feet. It was Lestella who was at second base. The ball bounced off of his glove 
and the winning run scored in walk-off fashion. Here's McGee now, is driven in two against Kimbrell. There's that low strike to Quinn Walcott. Has been accurate on and has been calling throughout the ball game. He has, and you have to give credit for consistency. I thought maybe he was bringing it down a little bit as the game went on, but he's held steadfast on that pitch being a strike. That's all you want is consistency. In the dirt, a ball and a strike. Still a four-run game. McGee has two grand slams in his career, but he's homered once this year, despite think, driving in 34 runs. I think realistically, listen, it's always possible he could run into one and Kimbrell makes a mistake and McGee gets it, but the reality is they're looking for a line drive here, preferably something at the gap that could potentially clear the bases. So filthy. That is an unbelievable breaking pitch. I think you could hear McGee muttering <laughs> as the ball came across the plate. Yeah, I mean, it's just so hard to stay in there for a right handed hitter, and you even see McGee's front hip come out just a little bit. It is hard to stay back and stay loaded when you feel like that slider's coming right at you. Kimbrell ready. One, two coming. It stays at one and two. 98 miles an hour. He dialed up. This is the fun part of the game that I love the strategy as you get late way late on the fastball Watch the breaking ball You have to think he's trying to shorten up the swing not trying to pull it What are you gonna do is he bury the breaking bars and try to blow the fastball by him? another one two Just no That's the old habits die hard for me watching that the sound effects that you make this looks like it got cornered to me Maybe just off as the ball cut a little bit. Good job by Laird by giving Walcott a good look at it, trying to get that strike for his pitcher. He's a very good receiver to go along with it. Good calling that he does as well. So he went fastball there after going fastball up. What does he do? Two and two. Great ball. Oh, and McGee left it alone. Full count. If he throws that for a strike, McGee probably has no chance after the fastball that he just saw before that. But now for Kimbrell, you have to just split the plate, center cut with the fastball, your best against his best. The odds of him hitting a home run are so low that you have to take that chance. You still have a four run lead. Go right at your hitter here. Kimbrell trying to tie John Smoltz with the all time Braves saves mark. McGee trying to keep this game alive. 3 2 coming. Ground ball slowly hits. Simmons gathers and throws, and the Braves win it. Move over, Smoltzy. Greg Kimbrell has arrived. One hundred and fifty-four career saves for Kimbrell, and many more to come. In a game that he didn't think he was going to get into, he finally gets in. He ties Smoltz, and Atlanta has taken. The first two of this series. Well, this was a really good game. Very nice job by Urban Santana to bounce back after three rough starts. And for Craig Kimbrell, as he now ties John Smoltz, he earned every bit of that save. Braves win it 9 5 for CJ Nikowski and our entire Fox Sports 1 crew. Rich Waltz with you from Miami. The Braves win it 9 5. Andrelton Simmons finishes. And Atlanta has a two game lead on top in the National League East. Let's go to UFC pre fight, 9 5 final here.